Nothing has really changed between the end of 2022 and the first day of 2023. The inflation and interest rate shock that drove markets weaker in 2022. I think that sort of fever is breaking. If we're seeing inflation normalize, that should support some of the value of stocks. For equity markets in and of themselves, a lack of inflation was not a bad backdrop for them for the last decade. Our bear case is actually kind of, we avoid a recession, but not the slowdown. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom King and Lisa Abramitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures right now unchanged on the S&P. Confirmation from Amazon in the last 24 hours. They will be eliminating 18,000 oh. jobs. TK, dip in the ocean for a company that large. You go to the Bloomberg DES screen, you do the math. Amazon canning 0.011658% of employees, that's 1.17 times 10 to the minus 2 employees. How about scientific notation on a Thursday? You need that. But it is serious for the corporate side. They're, they're taking it out. This is not people on 3rd Avenue unloading boxes. It's the corporate side. They're extended. Salesforce extended. Who is not extended off the I think pandemic? you're right to make that distinction. It's serious for the individuals <clears throat> losing their jobs. Yeah. When Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon, comes out and says it will help us achieve, quote, a stronger cost structure, Tom, would you push back against that based on the scale of what you've seen? They overexpanded, and I don't think, you know, CFA types should f find anyone guilty of trying to game the pandemic. I think company to company to company, they're going, hey, it's over, we're going to pare back. But what I think you'll really see, John, is they're going to eliminate these jobs. And frankly, Lisa, they're going to hire other jobs, tech jobs, whatever. Well, actually, this is the actual distinction, <clears throat> is that some of these jobs are tech jobs, that these are the corporate jobs, that this isn't the uh, warehouse workers. Yes, yeah. they have one and a half million employees at Amazon, but we're talking about a significant proportion of human resources. Yes. The question around yeah, the Echo fair. devices, some real initiatives are trying to pare back. Is this the tip of the iceberg for some of the tech companies that are trying trying to right-size in a new era. Lisa, this is where the excess is. We've talked about this repeatedly, and I have to say there was a line in that statement from Andy Jassy that sounded a lot like Mark Benioff yesterday from Salesforce, when Andy Jassy said this year's review has been more difficult given the uncertain economy and that we've hired rapidly over the last several years. Yesterday, Salesforce, the leader of that company, as our revenue accelerated through the pandemic, we hired too many people leading into this economic downturn. I'll go back to a question that you and I asked at the end of last year as we closed out 2022. Are we talking about the excess of the last two years or the excess of the last 10 years? Now, if it's the last two, this is the adjustment. If it's the last 10 with the discipline of 5% federal funds rates for this particular industry, then there might be a lot more to go. Which is the reason why a lot of people think that perhaps tech hasn't seen the, all, the, the brunt of it, that hasn't seen the full of it, even despite some of the underperformance last year. There's more to go because it's not just a repricing of the assets as a result of high rates. It's a rethinking I, of the industry. We need to put things in perspective here. Amazon at the EBITDA line, down the income statement, makes 12, 13, 14. 14%, maybe even 15%. Walmart makes 5 or 6%. Amazon is hugely profitable. They just overreached in, in coming out of the pandemic. That's all. She's just right now. Yeah. Almost unchanged. TK, you really put a blunt full stop on there. Anyway, futures up by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. TK, should we check out the market just briefly? Look at the bond please, market. Please, yeah, basis points, 20 basis points lower on a US 10-year over the last couple of days on a 10 year right now 368.82 tom we reset for 23 is the market much resilient lower yields. though the vix has barely moved the dow's barely moved spx up a little bit spx did better yesterday but you know i i go with the pundits matt hornbach was talking about this you know it's a pretty resilient market i think it was a resilient market in the face of some pretty punchy fed talk yeah yesterday yeah. the fed speaking of fed I, minutes I neil kashkari yeah. it was harsh we'll pick up on that in a little moment we'll catch up with russ kostrick in about two minutes' time. Bramo, tons coming up, tons of data going into payrolls Friday. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with the labor market. Today at 8.15, we get US ADP employment change report. We can discuss whether it's relevant. Either way, it'll be one of the tea leaves. And then at 8.30 a.m., we get US initial jobless claims. 
chart crime of the day. I'm going to look at initial jobless claims. And there's no way for me to not make this a chart crime, John. I actually was looking at different ways to try to paint this. And I tried to do it for only the past two years. It still is a chart crime because of how high things were. That said, you can see it really hasn't picked up in terms of how many people are filing for unemployment benefits. Today, the circus that we've seen down in D.C. does continue. The House of Representatives is adjourned until noon today. Basically, this is to avoid a yeah. seventh public defeat of Kevin McCarthy. How much can they really get people to come to the table, Tom? This is a big right. question. Lisa, what's important to me, somebody stopped me on the street and asked me this question. I said, I'll ask Bramo, can they do auctions of treasuries if the House of Representatives is not in session? <laughs> I believe that it just uh, it closes the p potential deliberations in the House of Representatives, not the entirety of government. Today, we also get a host of Fed speak, including Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic at 920, and James Bullard, Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, coming in in 120. Trying to follow on, John, to what you were talking about yesterday with Neil Kashkari. Do they talk about a 5.6% terminal Fed funds rate and then staying there for a long time? Do they talk about the balance of risk still firmly being with inflation, not necessarily torpedoing the economy? And how come the market hasn't responded more to the meeting minutes that were firmly hawkish to your point, Tree. perhaps waking up today a little bit more? Lisa, thank you. Thank you very much. Here's the line from Ellen Zentner over at Morgan Stanley. Financial conditions are too easy, reflecting a misperception among investors of the Fed's reaction function. Let's get Russ Kostrick's view on that, the portfolio manager for the BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. Russ, would you agree with that line from Ellen Zentner and Morgan Stanley? Well, good morning, Jonathan. I think I'd agree with the fact that there's clearly this tension right now within the Federal Reserve. This is not a new thing. This is what derailed the market back in August, where they're concerned about the market getting ahead of itself, whether that's a function of the stock market going too high, credit markets getting too tight. There is that concern that if financial conditions ease off too much, is that going to hamper their fight against inflation? And I, I, I look, Russ, where we are, and we have to piece this together. You have the responsibility to piece it together with portfolio allocation. How are you reallocating? So honestly, you know, Tom, we're pretty much going into 23 the way we left 22. Uh, we're not making a major change right now. So what does the portfolio look like? We're underweight equities. We're underweight bonds. We're emphasizing carrying the portfolio because in a market that's range bound, we want to be able to earn some income for our clients. We're focused on quality stocks. Now, I do think we're going to get to a point later in the year, probably in the first half, where we're closer to a Fed pivot. At that point, if valuations are where they are or a bit lower, I think you're going to get a very good tradable bottom. But this is not the point where I think you want to load up on risk. Are the, are the cost cuttings going to be efficacious as every corporation and every sector goes out and recalibrates here, as we see from tech and all that? I, I don't mean to micro call it, but are they going to be efficacious in helping their margins? Are they actually going to have impact? Well, let's start with a couple of things. I mean, Tom, I think you, you raised a very important point, you know, a few minutes ago. You know, big tech is ridiculously profitable. You know, if you look at most of the companies in the NASDAQ 100, particularly the mega cap tech names, their cash flow, their profitability is enormous. Margins are still close to a record high. So, yes, companies are going to try to manage costs that arguably climbed up a little too much during the, the euphoria post-pandemic. But the reality is these are still very profitable companies. We're not talking about 2000 when you had the NASDAQ 100 and barely any profitability. Russ, I can't let you get away with saying the word pivot without really pressing into what that means. You think that with all of this backdrop and the potential pain that we're seeing in terms of layoffs, there will be a pivot. What does pivot mean? Does it mean rate cuts? Does it mean a pause? I think it's more of a pause. I, I, I think the Fed has been very clear. And again, conditions can change and they reserve the right to change their minds. But it's not necessarily practical to expect cuts this year. The question is, where, where's the terminal Fed funds rate? Is it five, five and a quarter? Market right now is, uh, you know, forecasting somewhere in the zip code of five percent. Or do conditions force them to go much higher than that, to five and a half, five and three quarters? I think that's the question the market right now is trying to resolve. As you see signs of deceleration and inflation, as you see some soft in the labor market, and you get clarity around that, that I think is when you get uh, a more tradable bottom in, in financial markets. Can we get to a pivot, Russ, if we don't get a significant sell-off in equities, if we don't get the tightening fin financial conditions that the Fed has been looking for? Yes, I think you can. I, I, I think the Fed is clearly 
financial conditions are, are front and center. But at the end of the day, they've told us what they're focused on. And if I had to focus on one factor, it's going to be the labor market, because we know that headline inflation is coming down. Uh, goods inflation is coming down. What has been remarkably resilient has been the labor market. And that's where I think the Fed is going to focus, not necessarily on whether the S&P 500 is at 3,700 or 3,900. Russ, can you help me understand what's going on with the labor market? So I looked at the quits rate yesterday. Got the jobs report, job openings. Quits are up. Quits picked up for the first time since February. That screams confidence in the labor market. Job openings still about 1.7 <clears throat> openings for every single unemployed American. Again, that screams a tight labor market. Then, Russ, I see this news from Salesforce, from Amazon, from others as well. Russ, we're trying to work out, what should I believe here? What the corporations in one industry are telling me or what the official right. data is telling me month on month, week on week? Well, I think, I think you hit it. It's, what, it's industry by industry. And that is why this is such a difficult labor market. Absolutely, we're seeing uh, layoffs in tech. Uh, we're seeing softening in parts of the professional uh, class. But if you look at other parts of the labor market, hospitality, restaurants, healthcare, these segments of the economy lost hundreds of thousands of workers during the pandemic that have never come back. They're still missing workers, which is why the quit rate is still high. And it's why the labor market may remain somewhat resilient at least in those parts of the market that are playing catch up with all of these dislocations that happened during the pandemic. Hey, Russ, this was great. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Happy New Year to you and the team. Thank you, sir. Russ Kostrick there Happy of BlackRock. <clears throat> TK, can you make sense of that? I think there's a number of themes here. I think Ben Emmons nailed it along with James Bullard, who rightly so we hear from today. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated how Bullard recalibrates here. Emmons says it's simple. The job market is so strong, you need a 7% rate Oof. to begin to adjust it. That's a, an intellectual reach for me. I can't get there. I'll go back to what Sabatra Japa said of Sokchen just a couple of days ago. She said to me, Lisa, ultimately, the distance from three and a half to four and a half, a lot of hard work. She thinks the Fed needs to do a fair bit more through the rest of this year. Especially because of this structural tightness in the labor market. We were talking yesterday about how a lot of the older and younger workers haven't come back, may not come back. How do you get to an unemployment level when we need workers? And we still do, even with certain companies laying people off. Mm -hmm. Jobless claims coming up at 8.30 Eastern time. More economic data. And then on to payrolls tomorrow. I always find the first week of the year kind of jarring because we have that payroll sprint clumsy. on that Friday. Cl I don't remember it 20, 30 years ago. Do, do you know clumsy. what I mean? It's clumsy. You, you want to start off slow. It's clumsy. Just build up gradually. I took the tree down. That's your plea? Just do <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I took the tree down. Oh, did you? Yeah, it was a train wreck. Did you, did you make a mess? Next year we're getting a fake. You've got needles I go, everywhere. I go, I'm sitting there holding the thing up in the kitchen like this. I'm coming through. I'm taking out antiques. With your and she screams, tree. next year we're getting a tree like Pharaoh. <laughs> She's a wise woman. Live from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, it's another sign that a tech industry slump is getting worse. Amazon cutting more than 18,000 jobs in a round of layoffs aimed at the corporate ranks. Most of the jobs being cut are in Amazon's retail division and human resource areas like recruiting. The company has more than 1.5 million workers worldwide. On Capitol Hill, Kevin McCarthy and Republican dissidents still haven't reached a deal to make him the Speaker of the House. McCarthy has been defeated in six rounds of voting over two days. 20 hardline conservatives are blocking his bid. McCarthy says there has been a lot of progress in negotiations. Still, there's no resolution just yet. Federal Reserve officials have reaffirmed their resolve to bring down inflation. They also warned investors not to underestimate their will to keep interest rates high for some time. Those points came from minutes of last month's policymakers meeting. The U.S. is edging closer to send armored vehicles to Ukraine. On Wednesday, President Biden acknowledged that Bradley fighting vehicles may be part of another U.S. military aid package. The Bradley is a troop carrier that is equipped with anti-tank missiles and a 25-millimeter cannon. Meanwhile, France says it will provide Ukraine with light combat tanks. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
they want us divided. They want us to fight each other. That much has been made clear by the popcorn and blankets and alcohol that is coming over there. We are making history in this process. And we are showing the American people that this process works. And just a couple of quotes from Chinese state media. The events are chaotic, phenomena of spread and aggravation of the disease of the U.S. political system. Faced with the political chaos in the U.S., there is a sharp question whether the political class of the country is able to govern. Six rounds of voting over two days and still no House Speaker. 20 Republicans voting against supporting Kevin McCarthy. The question now, if not him, then who? A few names being floated, Tom, including Steve Scalise of Louisiana, Patrick McHenry of North Carolina, and the debate TK in D.C. continues. Floating this morning, and the distinction, John, to me, is in Greg Villiers' note this morning where, you know, as, as Lisa said in the news flow, McCarthy's got the up and up and up and that baloney. He is so desperate, it's rumored that he is giving it up where one representative can push the Speaker of the House of Representatives out. That, to me, was unimaginable. Just to be clear here, this is a feature of democracy. I want to be clear about that. We included some sound there on some commentary by Chinese state media on what was taking place in the United States of America. I think that should make us feel deeply uncomfortable about what's taking place. What would you prefer? Yes, this is chaotic, but would you prefer this or what happened on the Politburo, the Standing Committee, just a couple of months ago? It's a great point. The feature of a mess in the muddle, the muddle through to something that is a consensus that isn't necessarily going to be a straight line. It's less efficient, but it might be uh, more representative of the people's wishes. That said, there is a question of getting actual work done Without a doubt. During, the day, during this week, during this year. And there is a question about whether there is a desire to bring things to a halt because of how disorderly some members think that the overall process is, which raises some serious existential questions. And as you've indicated, incredibly rare for this to happen, Tom. First time in 100 years? 1923. To see it go on this long? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's been other times back in the 19th century, but it's highly unusual. It's her fault. Let's go to Anne-Marie Horton, Bloomberg, Washington correspondent. And Anne-Marie, let me just go to the date agenda today. I know this afternoon, I guess we're going to have vote seven, vote eight, whatever. What will Speaker McCarthy, Speaker to be McCarthy, Speaker designate McCarthy, what is his to do list this morning before the session starts? Count the votes. Does he have them, right? Can he line up those 20 um, dissidents in his party and at least try to get 16 of them to vote for him? He can also try to get individuals, likely not going to come from the Democratic side, but individuals to at least vote present to bring down the number needed so he can win that majority. Because if it's not every single member on the floor voting, potentially he doesn't need 218. He needs much less. That happened in the past with Pelosi, Newt Gingrich, Boehner. But anyway, he needs to get the math sorted. And at this moment, it remains to be seen if he was able to move the needle last night. They adjourned at 8 p.m. Talks went late into the evening. What we are hearing, though, Tom, is that potentially some of these concessions, really, which is giving away the kitchen sink, are now fully on the table, like a motion to vacate by one person, meeting one individual could call for a vote of confidence and oust him if he's speaker. So what you're seeing now could potentially foreshadow another fight for the speakership even this year. With that in mind, why does Kevin McCarthy want this job? It is a great question. I think that when you're throwing out other names of John, of individuals that potentially could be named, like Scalise, like Patrick McHenry, who I think has the same stylist as Tom, you think, why would any of these people want these jobs? No one is talking about the fact that they want this job, but it's really about who can actually win the numbers more so than who wants this job. But Kevin McCarthy has a long history of wanting this job. He thought he was going to get it in 2015. He didn't. And now he feels like, and, you know, the reporting is, and he's made very clear behind closed doors, that he has waited in line, and it is his time, and he deserves this. And, Marie, on a larger uh, scale, what do McCarthy's opponents really want? It depends who you ask within this 20 group of dissenters, right? Um, the majority of these individuals are ultra MAGA. Many of them are election deniers. And the whole majority, I think, besides two of them, are election deniers. Most of them were backed by the former president in the latest uh, midterm election campaign. So some of them are just never Kevins. They do not trust him. They think he flip-flops, and they do not want to see him win the gavel. If he's not able to at least 
assuage a few of those never Kevin's maybe even just to vote present not for him he could be in trouble the others like Chip Roy ultra conservative from Texas was saying you know a deal can always be cut so for some of them it's making sure you have more conservatives on really important committees making sure potentially there is this one individual of a motion to vacate only one person can call that up for some, it is about changing some of the rules of the game on the floor. Well, this is where it gets really interesting to me, Anne-Marie, because you started talking about some component uh, that really supported the former president and our election deniers, uh, and very much for the former President Trump. But President Trump, former President Trump, came out and actually said, come on, vote for McCarthy, get behind him. And that did not sway anything. That didn't move the needle. What does that say about the so-called Trump movement moving beyond Trump? I'm so happy you brought this up, Lisa, because after we talk about, obviously, having a House of Representatives, having a speaker, the conversation for 2023 and 2024 is obviously going to be the presidential election. And the former president has announced he is running, right? He is running a campaign that all but seems evaporated. But what you do see is they are absolutely just shrugging off his urge over Truth Social. Apparently, he was making calls, according to... Uh, Representative Boebert, who went on the floor and said, you know, we're getting calls from what she called her favorite president, but she said, actually, he needs to call McCarthy and tell him not to vote. He doesn't have the votes. They are ignoring his pleas, which just shows that they don't actually have the confidence in him, do they, in terms of leading this party into 2024 if they won't even take his advice on who should be Speaker Well, anne just briefly, can we finish there? What is happening with the former president's campaign? Where is it? What is it? What does it look like? It's a great question. It, I mean, he's not really doing rallies. He just seems to be in Mar-a-Lago making some of these calls, deciding whether or not on some issues he wants to get involved in. People I talk to say it's pretty much not happening. It's disappeared. It's early days. Let's see what it looks like at the back end of 23. Yeah. AMH I, down I got in DC. 15 more questions. Are you Maybe letting that go? Are you letting that dig no, it? Just... Your style is go. You're not going to stick up for your well, stylist. Well, she does that. You know, my, my well, first of all, I fired my stylist a year ago. You know, no, I fired my stylist a year ago. How many years ago was that? Just, just a, a year, year ago. ago. Okay. Just a year ago. And, and a lot changed. You know, they, you know, they, they it, it was emotional. Can you it tell us emotional. about how things, you know, to Lisa's point, how things developed after you parted ways with your stylist? Like, what, we was, did the a new, job what search. was the new change? You know, we did a job search. And, and <laughs> Overhaul. Different size bow tie. Clearly, yeah. clearly massive change here. <laughs> this is one of my data. oldest bow ties today. This okay. is like 40 years old. This is old Burberry from way, way back. Oh, nice. Very British. It's sort of, it's got a bigger statement to that it. That was before Chris nice. Bailey. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, this was like four styles ago. Also three wives. Four styles. <laughs> okay, that was, yeah, you said that and I didn't. I'm trying to push forward to this morning, 8.30 Eastern Move time. Moving on. Jobless claims coming out a little bit later. Yes, I'll be jobless. So just, just to, you might be. Just to reflect on the labour market data we've had so far, can you construct an argument that this labour market is weak when we're expecting numbers, Lisa, like 200K, something in and around 225 on jobless claims later today, 200,000 payrolls? tomorrow, unemployment in and around 3.5% and wages of about 5%. That's the <clears throat> argument of the more constructive people in the market right now saying that I just don't see it yet. I see it in big tech. I just don't see it in the numbers. And this is what the Fed is looking at. You asked Russ Kostrich about uh, what we saw yesterday with the JOLTS data, <clears throat> job openings coming out incredibly strong. Where are you looking for this labor market weakness? If you can see, uh, the openings actually revised upward for October and then coming in uh, stronger than expected, more than expected, still at about 1.7 per each unemployed American. It came out of surveillance nap yesterday. First thing I did is look at Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. It's stunning where it's moved from October. It's gone the wrong way for Paul. Russ mentioned this. We've gone from a negative one standard deviation restrictive to John's stunning accommodation this morning, negative 0.296 standard deviations. That's what they're watching in Washington. We'll build on that in just a moment. Futures right now up a tenth of 1%. Live from New York. Good morning to you. Twenty-six hours away from the payrolls report, 
We're counting down. <laughs> Equity futures up by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. We're TK hates those yeah, clocks, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, about to say, he just yeah, absolutely like despises clock. those clocks. <laughs> two hours away from jobless claims as well. Good morning to you. Equity futures on the Nasdaq up two tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 yesterday, the broader equity market, faced down some pretty tough hawkish Fed speak, yes. traded higher yesterday. Yes. But guess where the underperformance has been over the last couple of days? Energy equities. Crude over the last two days, Tom, is down by 9% plus to kick off 2023. Good morning, all the memories of Al Goldman at A.G. Edwards in St. Louis and the team of Mark Keller. They did some academic survey once that the correlation of net gas prices to the temperature at the subway station by Trinity Church is about a <laughs> 0.74. And the answer is it's warm in Europe, like record warmth. It's warm here warm too. warm here. Could you warm believe here yesterday? Too. It was yeah. ridiculous. It was bizarre. It was spring-like, wasn't it? Yeah, beyond that, it was edge of, it was like the edge of May. I've got to say, it's a bit of a head fake. You know what's going to happen? We're going to get absolutely pulverized by the end of the month, aren't we? You know, there we I go. hate that. It does my head That's in. You sort spirit. of like get comfortable, get ready for spring, yeah. feeling good about yourself. It's Can the I? 4th of January. <laughs> to our conversation yesterday. And then winter's like, get a grip. Yeah. But coal hasn't come down. You know, it's, it's this whole coal switching thing is, what did Savita say yesterday? I think the coal story is really interesting to see yeah. the reports that we're putting out here at Bloomberg that... China's thinking about importing Australian coal again. There's yeah. been a big dispute over that for the last couple of years. As for Savita yesterday, just in terms of sentiment, mm -hmm. she thinks sentiment mm -hmm. on the equity market is far too depressed. She's thinking about buying or at least advocating that people should buy in January, but not the S&P 500. So I want to be really clear about that. When you look at Savita's year-end price target on the S&P, which isn't for much of a gain on the S&P 500, if there is a gain in it at all, She's advocating buying stocks, but thinking more along the lines of the small caps at the moment. The so small she's caps not all and likewise with the energy story, staying on board with that, but just hating big tech. And you just see that a lot okay. from a lot of people, which is why or they don't like the S and P 500 <clears throat> and the index level story. Seeing that uh, right now, Tom Ford is scheduled to be with us on Amazon here, and that's good. He's really, really smart on Amazon right now. Smart in the American economy. With high frequency economics, Rabila Faruqi joins us with an update. Rabila, let's dive into tomorrow's jobs report. We've really been remiss on actually looking at it. John shocked me with a 200,000 non-farm yeah. payroll statistic uh, yesterday. Can we really keep above 200,000 job formation off NFP? I mean, right now, uh, good morning, happy new year. Right now, what we're seeing is a very strong job, job market. Demand is still there, you know, 400 basis points of tightening, more than that. And we still haven't seen demand really come down in a substantial way. Payrolls have slowed, right? We do know, but really well above break-even levels. And it's really not clear that uh, without the supply and without the response right. from households and businesses yet, that we're actually going to see an adjustment. Our base case is that, yes, we're going to see payrolls slow. We're going to see the unemployment rate uh, go up, uh, you know, maybe to four and a half percentage point. You know, that's... Uh, that's our base case, but really we're not seeing much right. right now in terms of a moderation. What is the wage dynamic? Is it wage gains for the bottom, say, quintile? Is it, is it, what's the, the nuance of wages you will study tomorrow at 8.30? I mean, wages are still rising at a pace that is just not consistent with the 2% target. That's what the Fed has already told us. That's what we know. We are seeing wage gains. You know, if you look at leisure and hospitality, they're still rising at a very rapid pace. If you look at the rear and year changes, but they have moderated. We've also seen the year and year change in average hourly earnings come down. But really, you know, without the supply coming back, this is going to be a sticky problem. We're just not seeing the type of improvement you would expect to see with this much tightening. So all this does is that, you know, if this is the, what the Fed is looking at, and, you know, if there is no response, that the risk is that they go even more than what we are estimating. Rubila, the market doesn't believe what you're saying. The market is yep. pushing back against this. The market is saying, look, if you look at the disinflation, the Fed's going to blink. They're going to pause, certainly in the next couple of months, despite the fact that there still is very apparent strength in the labor market. What do you make of this dissonance? Who's right? Um, I think the Fed and the market are on a collision course, and the Fed is not going to step back. So I think there's going to be a lot of volatility. Uh, the Fed's message has been very clear. Uh, the focus is primarily on inflation, even if at the cost of a slowdown or a recession. So I think, uh, you know, the faster markets adjust to that message, the better it will be. But it doesn't seem that it's going to happen. I don't think the Fed is going to blink. I think the Fed is very focused on 
uh, one job, and the job is to bring inflation back down to, to the 2% to the target. The issue now is, you know, as we move closer, uh, you know, to that terminal rate, how are the, you know, how are uh, markets going to respond? And once we get to that terminal rate and the Fed says we're going to stay here for a while, I think that's where the adjustment is going to happen. But, you know, let's not be confused about this. The Fed is very clear about what their, what their intentions are. Perhaps the market is also looking at some of the disinflation that we're seeing or uh, the slowdown that we're seeing over in France, over in Germany, over in Spain, seeing a potential uh, potential for a softer than expected CPI come next right. week. Is that enough or really does this entirely lie with the labor market? Can the Fed continue to justify going faster and higher than many people think just based on the strength that we see in the labor market? Well, they've been very clear, right? I mean, they're talking about the component of CPI, which is directly related to wages, which, you know, they want to avoid a wage price spiral. And, and they're not seeing it yet, but that is what they want to avoid. Inflation, if we look at our numbers, we expect, you know, year-on-year -year inflation in the first quarter to, you know, slow, slow, slow down from a five-handle to a four, wow. and then end the year around three-and-a-half-ish. So that's still well above, you know. Unless we are predicting a recession that just results in a collapse in prices, that might get the right. Fed room to ease, but that is not, you know, what we are seeing in the numbers. That's not what we're seeing in the economy. You know, Rebele, I've been I've been reading Paul Merton's iconic study, academic study of inflation in Champagne and the profound effects it's had on Bollinger. Forget about the fancy talk. On a social basis, how is this inflation affecting us day to day in America? How strapped are we as we go into this jobs report? Inflation has been, uh, you know, a very huge factor in how households have uh, fared over the 2022. But household balance sheets are still very strong. You know, a 40-year high in prices, and we still did not see contraction in spending. We still have excess savings. We still have, uh, you know, uh, wages rising at a pace. They're not keeping up with inflation, but they're still rising at a pace that is above the pre-pandemic trend. Now, in 2023, what we expect is as prices start to ease, real disposable incomes, we're already seeing that, right, in the quarter. They're declining on a year-on-year -year basis, but we are seeing the quarterly change has turned positive. So I think there is, there are a lot of stresses across income groups. Food prices are still very high. Energy prices year-on-year -year are still very high. It's just that we expect to see some relief this year as prices, uh, you know, continue to come down. I, I, I look, Rabila, at what we see tomorrow, and I just find it to be an original jobs report. How far is this jobs report from where Chairman Powell wants it to be? Like, in it's, timeline, is he looking at a jobs report this autumn? Is he looking at a jobs report, dare I say, into 2024? I mean, from their perspective, they expect to see the cumulative effects of, you know, what they've done so far and what would probably be 500 basis points of tightening to start showing up pretty quickly, probably in the first quarter of this year and then going forward. The issue is that, you know, we're just not seeing that demand rebalance. If you look at the Joel's data, if you look at jobless claims, and it's just not happening. So, I, you know, I think the Fed is just caught in a very tough spot in that they have delivered a lot, and they are probably going to de deliver maybe another 75 basis points. But it's not clear that that's going to be enough. But, you know, from their perspective, they have to wait and see what the lag and cumulative effects are on the labour market and inflation. Rabila, thank you. Rabila Faruqi there thank you. of High Frequency Economics. Rabila, going through some of the issues, forgive me because I'm about to quote Fed Minutes, so if you want to go away and make a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, do whatever you've got to do. Give me some tea, please. I'm going to go through these minutes right now. Please. So this is how the risks are set up for the Fed, and they articulated two risks that they've got to manage. Now, here's the first one. Quote, one risk was that an insufficiently restrictive monetary policy could cause inflation to remain above the committee's target for longer than anticipated. Here's the second risk. Quote, the other risk was that the lagged cumulative effect of policy tightening could end up being more restricted than is necessary. Now, how do you manage those two risks? Well, the fact of the matter is, you either believe they're balanced or you think there's one bigger risk in one direction. Now, I thought in November that the risks were asymmetric that they thought the biggest risk was under tightening. And now, Bram, I've got no idea. But clearly that was put in because there's one group that thinks one and another th group that thinks the other. 
this is where we get into game theory. And this is where, forgive me, you could turn off the TV. This is going to be complicated. But to me, there is a question. No, we uh, want that premise. Just, okay, stop. But, we want the ratings. Okay, we just great, want to walk please. away from the television okay, and let's, the No, no, but to <laughs> me, this is fascinating. This is the game theory aspect where basically people game on the Fed the three believe... of us are out of a job. <laughs> 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 off. Okay, fair. Yeah, my bow tie Look, started twirling. Like there, the question that I mm. have is how many people on the Fed believe in the balanced risk? but want to signal that they don't, that want to signal that the risks are asymmetric so that people don't buy equities. Because if they don't get a tightening oh, in financial on. conditions... they worried about people buying But that's equities. how they transmit their financial po their monetary policy. If they transmit it through the market and the market okay. isn't believing them because they're agree. trying to talk about a balanced risk, they, this becomes a real problem. And the market has called their bluff. I, I do not agree. This is ex ante. The answer is they are ex post, ex post, ex post. So is the Bank of England. So is the ECB. They have to, they're slaves to the data. They have to wait for the data and they're going to finally see if the job market cracks. They're going to wait for the data. They're going to look at GDP and, you know, the, all this recession gloom that's out there. Has there been enough recession gloom in the last we two weeks? We can get you some more. I, I think that, <clears throat> sitting in the middle of you both, I think you're both right. I think oh, there can Jesus, be a difference between you. What, you what they want to signal and what <laughs> they think they'll therapist. actually do. And ultimately what they'll do will depend on where the data comes in. And I think this goes to the financial conditions point. When it comes to those two risks and how you manage them, I think overwhelmingly they're still concerned about upside risk to inflation from policymaker to policymaker. But on the financial conditions point, I think that was the standout thing in the Fed minutes yesterday. Participants noted that because monetary policy worked importantly through financial markets and unwarranted easing in financial conditions, especially if driven by a misperception by the public of the committee's reaction function, would complicate the committee's effort to restore price stability. They don't want us to be talking about rate cuts, even if there's someone on that committee thinking that perhaps the data will need, require them to respond with rate cuts later this year. And that's why they're going to carry on saying the same thing until they're convinced that inflation's going back to 2%. The problem is how many people believe what Bill Dudley does, that the Fed is going to engineer a recession and can quickly uh, take it away by cutting rates. This is a more complicated economy. Much that. easier to say what Bill Dudley says when you're no longer at the Federal Reserve. That's fair too. And that's the big difference. 7.30 Eastern Time, Deborah Cunningham, absolutely fantastic on all of this, much better than us, the global liquidity market CIO of Federated Hermes. We'll catch up with her in about 50 minutes' time. Looking forward to it. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. It's another round of votes on this speakership. Today, lawmakers will meet again after Kevin McCarthy failed for a sixth time in his bid to be elected to lead the House. The California Republicans said a lot of progress was made, but still hardline conservatives didn't make it easy and there was no resolution to the standoff. IMF First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath is urging the Federal Reserve to press ahead with interest rate hikes. Gopinath tells the Financial Times that inflation in the U.S. has not turned the corner yet. She also expects monetary tightening in Europe to be more prolonged than the Fed's. China's new foreign minister says that relations between his country and the U.S. should not be a zero-sum game. Jim Chin Zhang has, has an op-ed in today's Washington Post. Now, Chin writes that the world is wide enough for both countries to prosper. Strikes on the British rail network reach a critical peak today. Some of London's biggest rail stations will be closed, while some airports will also be deprived of train service. Train drivers, represented by the Asleff Union, are walking out following a long dispute over pay. And Dell reportedly wants to phase out semiconductors made in China by 2024. According to Japan's Nikkei, the computer maker has also told suppliers to significantly reduce the amount of other components produced in China. Dell is said to want to diversify its supply chain because of concerns about U.S.-China tensions. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think the concerns me about tech companies, John, is that they're not good cost cutters traditionally, right? They're, they're growth companies. They tend to want to invest into these downturns. They, they want to invest, you know, aggressively through all periods of time. And they're just not good at cost cutting. And so they're going to be late on that. They're probably not going to do enough. 
And so it'll take longer than you think. And so the margin degradation can be more severe in those areas. Just brilliant to catch up with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley there, the chief U.S. equity strategist. You can find that interview in full on Bloomberg.com and, of course, on the Bloomberg Terminal. Your equity market set up as follows this morning. Futures drifting just a little bit higher on the S&P 500, up around about a tenth of 1%. At least has gone through the data a couple of times. 8.30 Eastern time, you get jobless claims. Then it's on to payrolls tomorrow. Looking forward to all of that. So far, we're seeing more tech companies deliver more cuts. It was Salesforce yesterday. It was Amazon announcing the following in the last 24 hours. 18,000 jobs to go, the most in company history. The company's CEO, Andy Jassy, saying, quote, Amazon has weathered uncertain and difficult inco- economies in the past, Tom, and we will continue to do so. These changes will help us pursue our long-term opportunities with a stronger cost structure. That last line, Tom, does 18,000 yeah. help you deliver a stronger Cost structure As Lisa at mentioned, a company it's that very large. Fo- it's very focused. It's focused in on corporate HR and, and the rest of it. I think Mike Wilson's dead on that this is whole new territory for the Silicon Valley crew. They've never really been through this before, I'll say, with some certitude. And my guess is I'm going to be optimistic. They're going to learn fast, and they're going to find out how easy it's, it's addictive. It's like the financial Wall Street business. They know they can do it every February. You think they keep tweaking quarter to quarter, though? I think they're going to get year? used to the efficacious ease of cost cutting they're going to learn like banking they're going to learn like wall street they're going to learn like ball bearing companies and the rest this may be a little bit different just because they're cutting some of the tech staff they're cutting some of the white collar workers and as we've talked about a lot of them will get jobs elsewhere it's not like they're not in demand. This is one of the most uh, in-demand industries. So if they're cutting talented individuals, you can imagine the banking industry, the car industry, a lot of others were going to suck them up. So this is the question, right? How much do you start to get this kind of pairing back of some of the talent that removes some of the upward dynamism from some of these companies? I think gone are the days where you have that special floor. You know that floor where... All the cool kids get together and they throw things against the wall and you see what sticks. Yeah, we call that. And the, just, you yeah. just throw money at that. Yeah. I thought you were talking about the massage room and the. No, uh, no, I'm not talking about 5 that. PM, uh, right, no, I'm not going in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. Well, there are surveillance <laughs> no, but wasn't there like all these services and perks, yoga, studio? I imagine like, that's yeah, going to come. PM, I imagine you know, that's, I saw the headlines things. recently about the coffee going at Goldman Sachs. I'm not going in that direction. <laughs> I'm talking, talking more along the lines of the likes of Alphabet, Tom. You know the story over at Google that there is this department that is just like other ideas. Well, moonshot. I'm not sure if you've What's got that changed? space for other ideas and moonshots right now with Fed funds at exactly. 4 or 5% That's and growth going in the other direction. About. This is directly from David Rubenstein less, yesterday on Mike Worth. All of a sudden, gravity's back, as Taleb says, and the gravity's back at Amazon. No question. That's the big change, Tom. No question about it. We're going to take a different take on this right now. Alex Webb is really quite good at Bloomberg Quick Take of looking away from the financials at the broader social aspect of these jobs announcement. Alex Webb, let's start there. What's the social ramifications at Salesforce, at Amazon, to the shock of layoffs and firings? Well, I think as you guys have been alluding to, this sort of perennial growth story that you go to these companies and, yeah, you can rake it in for a few years and find a job elsewhere, like, these companies have not really done big layoffs before. (coughs) You have to wonder whether there is an effect culturally um, on the inside. But I do think, ultimately, these are very... Are they call financial stories. You look at Salesforce, they've been enjoying 25, 30% growth for the best part of a decade. That is going to come right down, and they're expecting to 10, 15% growth in the next two years. So all of a sudden, far from being growth stocks, they have to focus on that bottom line. I think the number that's super interesting when you compare Amazon and Salesforce, they're two slightly different stories, mm-hmm. is looking at revenue per employee. And revenue per employee has come down over the past three years because Amazon massively over added too many warehouses, added too many employees. Salesforce's revenue per employee has continued to climb. It's just that the revenue number itself is not growing as quickly. So what they are doing is, you know, as Mike Wilson was saying, Salesforce, it seems, is getting in a little bit earlier than some of um, its rivals in, in ensuring that it has those healthy margins and can perhaps, you know, be considered more in the value category than, than growth. Um, as a consequence of these efforts. Alex, it's a very difficult story to get your hands around, or for me anyway, because you have on one hand the retail uh, segment of Amazon, all of the boxes that people get delivered, the fact that there may be fewer of them, but then you have this tech spending side of things, the the cloud computing, and this comes after Microsoft had a warning flag put on it from UBS about the potential for a reduction in cloud computing spending. How much is that underpinning 
a significant portion of these moves and indicates a broader reluctance by businesses to really spend on their capital infrastructure. So I think you're right. I'm not sure necessarily that there's going to be a reduction in cloud spending, but there might be a reduction in the pace of growth of cloud spending. And of course, these are growth stocks. That's therefore very important. I think when you look at Amazon, the, the narrative that had over time, over the past sort of 20 years, come to be accepted by the market was that, yes, Amazon might not be terribly profitable, but if they wanted to be profitable, they could be. They can flick a switch and all of a sudden, you know, the faucet gushes forth profit when they want to. The consequence, and that is, a lot of that is to do with AWS, of course, which has huge gross margins of 80% plus. The consequence of the lockdowns where they added all this extra headcount, they added a million people between 2019 and 2022, more than the whole US um, army, all of a sudden they have a far greater cost base. Right. It's a little bit harder to flick that switch and turn to profitability. So what they're doing here is you know, perhaps right-sizing a little bit, 18,000 as a percentage of 1 million, clearly not that considerable, but it gives them a little bit more um, flexibility right. if they wanted to return to that old narrative. Alex, where does Jeff Bezos fit into this? Was he the entrepreneur, the tycoon who said, build, 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 growth, 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 and the guy from the cloud business has to come in and mop up Mr. Bezos's mistakes? Is there any validity to that? That is certainly a thesis that a lot of people have been flogging. Look, Andy Jassy's background is very much in AWS. It's in that, that cash cow. Uh, and, you know, Bezos is the pioneer, certainly in terms of Amazon, but it's something that a lot of other companies have followed of, like, investing in growth, just throwing all your money, your, your surplus capital, if you have it, into driving that growth story because in the end it will pay off. What the lockdown showed is that if you grow too quickly, you're left with sort of, you know, redundant capacity that you can't use any time in the near future. Maybe that capacity you know, does come through in a couple of years' time, but they don't want to have you know, what they would see as extraneous capacity in the near term. Now, clearly that's hard for Amazon employees. And as you say, these are not necessarily the employees in the warehouses that are being cut, many of whom are in sh on short-term contracts. These are people administering it from the headquarters, the HR teams and so on. We haven't seen big cuts to the tech staff, the people at Amazon at least going on these big new bets. Um, those seem to be still in play. Alex, just briefly, can you describe the culture at Amazon? How do the people from AWS feel about the other side of the business? <clears throat> Well, I mean, look, I think they all recognize that without the e-commerce business, AWS wouldn't exist. It was basically built to support that business. The culture, broadly speaking, at Amazon is very thrifty. You know, you think about people flying to, um, to Seattle to, from London, perhaps, to go have the meetings at the headquarters. They fly coach. They don't get the sort of cushy business class seats that you might expect from big tech companies. Uh, you know, they tend to think that we are going to reward you by giving you generous paychecks, by giving you good stock options. The, as a whole, it's a pretty leanly run organization, which is why you see so much automation in the warehouses. You know, there's a lot of tech going into that stuff, and it does feed into some of the stuff that Amazon, that AWS does, because the, improve the tech in one place, that's something that you might be able to productize from a software as a service perspective for your AWS clients. Alex, thank you, buddy. We appreciate it. Thanks for the clarity. Alex Webb there out of London from Bloomberg. That stat that Alex mentioned a couple of minutes ago, can we sit on that for a moment? Please. One million roles from 2019 to 2022. Have we ever seen anything like that? No. In history? No. Ever? At any point? No. A million roles in three years? This is about distribution. It's unreal. If you do an MBA program, there's like this, 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 this. Nobody talks about distribution. You have to distribute the product, and that was the pandemic challenge, and that's where that had gone. Came. Well, we're talking about excess. You know, a lot of people talk about <clears> short and shallow. A potential downturn will be short and shallow because we didn't build up enough excess in the last couple of years. Well, that depends where you look, because there's a company that hired a million people in three years. That just sort of blows my mind. This goes to the question that you were asking. Are we talking about the excesses of the past two or three years? Or are we talking about the excesses of the past decade? And you think about tech as the growth industry and how much it subsumed other industries, whether it's retail or whether it's uh, just what happens in the corporate back offices. How much of this is paring back and tweaking as the tech world enters a new phase that's no longer growth, but it's more the establishment? I've got to say 18,000 for a company that big feels like a tweak, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. And that's, I'm just wondering if there's more to come from Amazon on the cost side. And where does it come from, given, well, how, yes. given what Alex Webb was talking about, how that company's right. already ran? And perhaps they're not going to publicize it quite as much. Ah, precisely. Features on the S&P 500, up two-tenths of a 1%. David Leibovitz of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, coming up next.
Nothing has really changed between the end of 2022 and the first day of 2023. The inflation and interest rate shock that drove markets weaker in 2022, I think that sort of fever is breaking. If we're seeing inflation normalize, that should support some of the value of stocks. For equity markets in and of themselves, a lack of inflation was not a bad backdrop for them for the last decade. Our bear case is actually kind of, we avoid a recession, but not the slowdown. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. How many more rate hikes do we need? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Rabbit. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK Equity Market's not doing much. A little bit more, bit more data coming out this morning, then on to payrolls tomorrow. Torsten Slock moments ago over at Apollo. The title of that piece, Tom, no more Fed hikes needed, it's question mark. Right on from Dominic Constum and a few others looking at where are we on a restrictive basis. Ben Emmons has been out front, too. And Slock just says, and here's the word, John, it's cumulative. You have to go to Vice Chairman Brainerd of how do these rate hikes add up and then how do you handle that in what I would call academically original territory. And there's Slock weighing in. Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed mm. was pretty punchy yeah. yesterday in that yeah. blog piece. I don't know if you had the opportunity to read it, but basically no. he wants to take rates through 5%. Uh -huh. He's conditioned by the experience of the 1970s and does not think this Fed should back away anytime soon. Yeah, he basically was saying uh, that it shouldn't even uh, be a consideration until the Fed is confident that inflation is peaked. He said, I have us pausing at 5.4 percent, but wherever that end point is, we won't immediately know if it is high enough to bring inflation back down to 2 percent. And then you've got Torsten Slock citing the San Francisco <laughs> Fed saying that it's clear that the demand side uh, of inflation has come down dramatically. So game over. The 1970s weighs on these guys so heavily, yeah. really heavily. You see it in every time they speak in yes. a speech. I mean, this was from Cash Gary, yesterday, given the experience of the 70s, the mistake the FOMC made and must avoid is to cut rates prematurely and then have inflation flare back up again. That's... I remember Al Arian writing about the risk of the 70s flip-flop last year, and TK, it clearly weighs on them. Yeah, and it weighs on them too because the Bank of Japan had the same flip-flop uh, happen, different terms, different moment. But I strongly take your point that, is, at least you mentioned this before we went on air this morning, this is wildly asymmetric, and they are scared stiff of the first rate cut that permeates monetary academics. I think Vice Chairman Clarida would, would agree. Well, with because that. once you start cutting, what's this market going to do? <clears throat> it's not going to cut in one. It's not going to price in one well, cut, you have is to it? Reverse. It's going to price yeah. in a cycle yeah, of, of cuts, yeah. and mm. that's the issue. Did you enjoy the Fed minutes yesterday? I good read. It was good. That's how I got to that sleep. better surveillance. That's nap. the nap started at 2 p.m. Eastern <laughs> time. Let's work through this price action for you and get you all up to speed. I'll give you a comprehensive market check in just a oh, moment. Please. Let's start with a brief one. Equity futures right now unchanged on the S&P 500. Yields coming up, not even a basis point on a 10-year, 369. In the FX market, 106.11. Tom Crude, 74.22, up by 1.9% over the previous two days, <clears throat> down 9% plus to kick off yeah. 2023. Big deal. I think the crude is a big, big deal, and pushing against it is a China opening and some of that enthusiasm. And the feeling I get from the, the $100 a barrel crew is when it goes, it's going to go. We just don't know when that is. Waiting I, I for this mount to, to click back in, in particularly from China. You heard Anrita Sam of Energy Aspects looking for triple digit crude. Bramo again later this year. That's her call. Honestly, I was thinking about that when you were talking about where the Fed is gaming out uh, rates, and I have to wonder how much the narrative is going to change in its head if we get another a pop in oil prices, in energy prices, especially in the face of really volatile weather. Today, what we're looking at is jobs data ahead of the jobs report tomorrow. ADP employment change comes out at 8.15 a.m. U.S. initial jobless claims, claims comes at 8.30 a.m. I keep going back to this, and I keep thinking, John, about what you said yesterday. It was a chart crime when I took a look at a longer-term view of jobless claims because of how distorted things were during the pandemic. That is true. However, it has flatlined on any scale that you look at in terms of the number of people filing to get uh, unemployment benefits. When does that start to pick up like the Fed wants? We haven't seen it yet, even though a lot of people are saying it will happen. Today, how House of Representatives continue with their deliberations. They have been adjourned since last night to avoid a seventh 
public uh, defeat of Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House. They're going to uh, reestablish some sort of vote perhaps at noon. They can't do anything until they have a Speaker. So let's see how long this drags on. And today, Fed Speak includes Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic at 9.20 a.m. and Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed at 1.20 p.m. Do they give a sense of where they fall on this balance of risks? John, we've been parsing through all of the uh, various machinations of Fed Speak. There really is a major question here. Are they willing to go full Kashkari and basically say <laughs> we are going to torpedo any growth, keep going, because we won't even know if we've seen the peak in inflation. Full Kashkari. <laughs> do you like that, Thomas? Full Kashkari. That meant something very what, different two what years would ago. we do without her? You and I would never come up with the concept Full Kashkari. Of full well, you have to remember that, that Lisa, this is her part-time job. She's a full-time, world-class financial columnist writing those beautiful headlines. That's right. If she wrote full, something this morning, it would be full Kashkari. Full Kashkari. David Livovitz knows what's the first question is now. The uh, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management joins us around the table. David, does Kashkari have friends? And good morning to you and happy new year. Good morning. Does Kashkari have friends at the Federal Reserve? Do you think he's got company? So I, I do think that he has company. I, I think that this is one of these instances where what the market wants to hear and what the market wants to see is very different from what the Fed is planning to deliver. And, and to reiterate the point that you just made, they are haunted by the 1970s and they, they are more than comfortable, and I think that investors need to come to terms with this, more than comfortable overdoing it and erring on the side of caution rather than allowing inflation to become more ingrained into the economy. So what do I do if I've gone to a big fancy bank and I took the right courses in school and I was 60-40 and I got cratered last year like none of us have ever seen? What's the new 60-40 this year, given the macro backdrop? Well, the first thing that I'll say is that, you know, despite the sell-off, the expected return from a 60-40 portfolio today is far superior to where it was 12 months ago, nearly double uh, based on our <clears> estimates. <throat> what I would say about 2022, the, the issue at hand, the reason why diversification didn't work was just because interest rates and inflation were at the center of the debate. And the one common variable when you're pricing stocks and bonds is rates. So if you can't figure out what rates are going to be, you can't price a bond, you can't price a stock, everything sells off together. And, and that was very much the story that last year, this year, you think about what people are talking about, they're worried about recession. They're worried about growth fears. And if we do see those growth fears kind of reassert themselves over the course of the next couple of weeks, I do think that that negative stock bond correlation will reassert itself. And so I'm not so sure the 6040 is dead. Uh, I think that the 6040 is actually looking better today than it was 12 months back. I wonder, though, about that downturn that everyone has confidence in. What do you take from the jobs data that we've been getting that indicates a very different picture? So I think this is what's so interesting. You know, pe people are looking at the economy in black and white today, and they're saying, you know, growth or recession. And what they don't understand is that the echoes of this pandemic are, are things that I don't think anybody was really ready to comprehend, right? We have a very strong labor market. We have a housing market in recession. We have cyclical sectors in the economy that are effectively in line with their long run average. Everything is at somewhat of a different place. And so, you know, I actually think what could bail the economy out next year is a labor market that proves to be more resilient, a labor market that does soften because that's what the Fed has said they want to see happen. But I actually think that what we're seeing here is just a reflection of these pandemic echoes and a little bit of labor hoarding, right? Businesses not wanting to get caught on the other side of the trade where they were for the better part of the past couple of years with not enough workers, right? So now they're, they're hesitant to let people go. So why is Mike Wilson wrong then, from your view, in basically coming out and saying that perhaps things will muddle along and we will avoid some sort of big downturn in the economy, but that doesn't mean that stocks aren't going to get hammered. In fact, that actually ups uh, the chance that they will. So the great debate is about earnings. And everybody has a different take on earnings. A lot of people like to say, well, on average, over the past 75 years, when we've had a recession, profits have fallen by 30%. If you actually isolate the period from the late 1960s through the early 1980s, which I would argue is an inflation environment more similar to the one we're in today, <clears throat> The average decline in profits was 15 percent. And, you know, I'm not I'm not Pollyannish. Right. I, I recognize that if we have a recession next year, corporate profits are going right. to decline. I think it's more about pricing in that magnitude of decline. And I think people may be overly pessimistic, not recognizing what inflation does for revenues. Was that a moment where Bramo went full Kashkari? I think so. I mean, you, you trash it on Mike Wilson. I mean, is, you know, but to your good point on full Kashkari, there's this bet 
being made now with a lot of certitude out there. I don't know where the certitude comes from. Well, full Kashkari like actually moves to the Mike Wilson point of view, which is that they can go to that level of rates and then uh, not necessarily see a complete recession, but consider. But the oh, question that we were just hearing from David is this issue of profits. Can companies continue to mint profits if you have consumers that are having more discretion with how much they spend and if you have a resilient labor market? It's very quite I think they question. can, but at what rate? How big are those margins going to be? And for the big tech firms that have been churning out double-digit growth for a long, long time, does that growth level come down? And what's the multiple you want to put on those names? And that's the difficult call you've got to make on a company like, say, Tesla. I caught up with Pierre Farago yesterday. He thinks that we can still grow at 30%, 40%. If that's the case, what multiple do you put on that name? Now we've got rates pushing 5%. That's been, the big change over the last 12 months has been the multiple story, Tom, and now we've got to work out the trajectory this, for earnings and growth. David, this is really critical. You guys have set up a more responsible, probabilist, probabilistic determination of the set of outcomes into June, into September. I hear others now comically talking with certitude, almost a single point or tenth of a point. You know, num John, you, you do better at this than me on the S&P guess. Why are we guessing with such accuracy? Haven't we been humbled enough? Well, I, I think not only is it interesting to see people so confident in their S&P forecasts, but so confident that we're going to have a recession this year, right? This would be the most predicted recession in the history of the data. And what I, what I think the problem is today, going back to what I was saying earlier, Lisa, is depending on where you look in the economy, you can kind of tell yourself whatever story you want. Oh, the labor market's very strong. The economy's not going to dip into recession. But look at the interest rate sensitive sectors. They've completely rolled over because of what the Fed has done. I mean, that really is going to be the question. And I think you know, taking a step back, when, when we think about the, the distribution of outcomes, to your point, it's not as binary as a lot of people believe it to be. It doesn't need to be black or white. It doesn't need to be growth or no growth. It could arguably be an environment where we muddle through, and perhaps we don't see that maximum downside that has become very consistent consensus uh, to go out there and, and espouse. It is consensus, without a doubt, Tom. Yes. Everyone piling in to say and almost the same thing, with some subtle differences here and there. David, thank you. It's good to see you, you, buddy, as always. David Leibovitz there of JP Morgan Asset Management. Did you watch the football yesterday? I uh, looked at a little bit of it, but I will watch tonight. I really want to bring this up. We did the World Cup thing, and thank you to all of you actually into football and those of you like, it's like an American thing we're watching every four years. One guy did not participate. He was from Norway. Yeah. And he, you know, all this Pele memory and all that we witness and the joy we witness, this guy from Man City, he's special, isn't he? Oh, without a doubt. How many games have they played now? Was it 16 games, something like that? He scored 21 goals. Do you know what the top scorer was in the Premier League last year, last season? Mm -hmm. Your man's son. Yeah. And Salah over at Liverpool. I think <clears throat> the tally was about 23. Yeah. 23 goals in a complete <clears throat> season, which is 38 games, but and this guy's done it in half the time. This guy's like he's Aaron Judge, he's like Otani, pick an NFL football player, and he got no love during the World Cup. I think you're great to make that comparison. Did I do okay on, there? On I could Aaron not Judge. have done that before I drank the Pharaoh tank. He, he's what you would call a one-trick pony. <clears throat> Just one trick, and he does it better than anyone. He only wants to touch the ball when he's going to score. That's it. There's no interest in coming back, helping out in the midfield, doing all that stuff. But he'll mature into that, right? He's so young. Maybe I think he's, he just an, it out. he's just an epic, one of a kind, I'm almost a throwback to the afternoon. number Chelsea nine goal scorer from back in the day. Man City. You're going to be watching that game? I think so. I think he's that special. So you'll sleep through the Fed minutes, but you won't sleep you through that. You got that right. <laughs> OK. From New York, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. It's another sign that a tech industry slump is getting worse. Amazon cutting more than 18,000 jobs in a round of layoffs aimed at the corporate ranks. Most of the jobs being cut are in Amazon's retail division and human resource areas like recruiting. The company has more than 1.5 million workers worldwide. The U.S. is edging closer to send armored vehicles to Ukraine. On Wednesday, President Biden acknowledged that Bradley fighting vehicles may be another U.S. military aid package. The Bradley is a troop carrier that is equipped with anti-tank missiles and a 25-millimeter cannon. Meanwhile, France says it will provide Ukraine with light combat tanks. The Securities and Exchange Commission is pushing back on Binance U.S.'s plan to buy bankrupt crypto lender Voyager Digital. And that deal is valued at about $1 billion. In a court filing, the SEC says the agreement doesn't include enough detail about Binance's ability to close the deal. Binance says it will provide any requested information. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
Congress that can't function is just embarrassing. We're the greatest nation in the world. How can that be? And we've had a lot of trouble with, I'm sorry for the noise, a lot of trouble with the attacks on our institutions already. And uh, it just, that, that, that's what worries me more than anything else. The President of the United States, Joe Biden, there, weighing in on things over in Congress in Washington, D.C. We'll pick up on that in just a moment. If you are just tuning in on TV and radio, welcome. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Here's a taste of flavour, a snapshot of the market for you waking up this Thursday. Going into jobless claims in about an hour and 13 minutes. Ton of Fed speak as well. Lisa will run you through that in a moment. Equity futures up by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Euro dollar not doing much here. 106.11 up a tenth of 1% also to the euro's favour. Euro strength there just a little bit. In the bond market, not much happening on a 10-year. 368.64. Tons happening in the previous two days. Move lower on a 10-year yield of about 18 basis points. And to round things out in crude, trying to rally, bounce back from the losses over the last couple of days. WTI right now at 74.36. TK. Very good. Uh, futures up five again. And, you know, I think it's a lift to it in that. One thing we do see here is on Ukraine, a changing story. We just had it in the news there of France maybe sending some form of tank. The United States maybe sending some form of, quote, vehicle. My vast knowledge on this is, well, Patton and the movie and the tanks of another time and place. Amory Hordern is with us from Washington. Amory, these tanks we may send, they're not out of the movies, are they? Um, no, not exactly, at, not out of the movies, especially one possibly coming from France. But you do see a push, at least Ukraine is pushing the West to make sure they continue to <clears throat> send the military weapons. And what you heard from a top um, intel individual from Ukraine is that they're very concerned that they sp said to ABC News about March and really the fighting starting to get a lot hotter in March coming off of the January, February winter months. We should note that Russia really suffered a major blow over the New Year's holiday, and they even admitted it. And they talked about the fact that they actually lost more people than they were expecting. This is probably the biggest casualty event that Russia has admitted since the start of the war, 89 people. And this is uh, with fighting in the Far East. And the defense ministry said this came down <clears throat> to the fact that soldiers were using mobile phones. New Year's Eve is an incredibly right. important moment for in the Russian culture. And they were calling home. And that's likely how the Ukrainians were able to, yeah, to find them. I saw that in the reports. But, Emery, what I would point out here is it's almost like a domino effect of France with tanks, U.S. with tanks, the pressure on Germany with tanks, is what we're going to see in the next six weeks, say, an arms buildup for Ukraine, where, as you correctly say, we need to anticipate a war that heats up. Well, also we have the Patriot missile system, right, which Dmitry Kuleba, the foreign minister, spoke about the fact that that process has already, already started. He didn't want to say where they were in the process, but the process of the U.S. transferring that missile battery has already started. But, Tom, there's a bigger uh, issue at play right here, and is the fact that NATO may actually change the rules so that 2 percent of your GDP, and this is really what Ukraine has laid bare for a lot of NATO countries, that never hit that 2 percent of GDP on defense spending target, it will no longer become an aim, potentially, we're not there yet, but it would become the base, meaning if you want to belong in NATO, you have to spend 2 percent of your GDP on defense spending. So while we're seeing almost piecemeal from some countries, there potentially could be a rethinking of how NATO members think about defense and their spending on defense, which would mean they're going to have more stockpiles. Given some of the turmoil that we've been talking about, the internecine turmoil in the United States, how much does that affect their leadership role on an international stage like NATO? Well, if you're talking about potentially more funding to Ukraine, right now, obviously, in the spending package and the defense bill, they got billions of dollars. But down the road, when you're looking at a House that still does not have any members or speaker, it's very difficult to see a path forward in the House of Representatives for a lot of aid to Ukraine. I mean, Kevin McCarthy had already made it very clear a few months ago that there would not be no longer a, quote, blank check. But it seems very difficult. These individuals cannot even agree on a speaker. Many of them have been critical about some of the funding and the money going to Ukraine. How will they view future potential aid packages over to Kiev? 
talking about uh, what's been going on with the House of Representatives looking for a speaker, a number of people have been uh, talking about the dissonance between what happened with the House yesterday and the fact that Senate uh, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell was with Joe Biden in Kentucky yesterday to talk about a new bridge that was going to be built to herald some of the infrastructure spending that was put out there that others in the Republican Party are saying we need to cut back on because we're spending too much. How is this being received, the Mitch McConnell's approach versus what's been going on in the uh, House? It was a great moment for the administration in terms of counter-programming. The president of the United States is standing alongside someone who he calls a friend, <laughs> but really does not agree with on many issues, but gave him credit and said, M Mitch McConnell, because of you, we were able to get this hard infrastructure over the line, bridges, roads, internet, these are things most Americans want to see coming out of Congress. They like the idea of hard infrastructure being fixed in their town, especially this bridge, which has a lot of history. Mitch McConnell is talking about a different path forward and a very much so a chasm almost than what you're seeing in the House. He's talking about working with a Democratic president and a bipartisanship uh, that he wants to see govern. At the same time, as they were speaking, you have Kevin McCarthy trying to have some backroom deals with a ultra-right wing of his party that does not want to see bipartisanship in Washington. Very different approaches. And this has been a big story for the Republican Party, not just this year, but the past decade. And it is going to really be the thing that dogs the House over the next two years. This is just the first of many fights. Anne-Marie, when the opposition is digging a hole, the last thing you want to do is draw attention to yourself. And I just wonder why the reports were circulating yesterday that the president might be visiting the border. Well, he was asked about it, right? Because he's going to Mexico on Monday. This is the three amigos, is what it's called, meeting between Mexico, That's Canada, right. America. <laughs> they, ha yeah, kind of like you three, um, they have not met since pre-COVID under true, the former though. President Trump. And there's been huge <laughs> issues. <laughs> I'll let you guys decide who's who. There's been huge issues, immigration and trade. The president was asked about it and he said, it is my intention to go to the border. Maybe the administration <clears throat> feels like now is an OK time with the midterms behind them. It is a moment, though, that they are going to draw <clears throat> scrutiny with these photos, if he's at the border, that the Republicans have been bashing them for months on. AMH, Dan in Washington, our Bloomberg Washington it's correspondent. Solid. She did fantastic. like four topics there. Yeah, I know. I'd do one if I was lucky. And she nailed it, like four topics. Boom, boom. She gets up at like 2 a.m. Did we ever talk about that Trudeau suit at the, at the G20 with, when he was with she? I didn't even notice. Of course oh, come on. You must there. have noticed. Come on. No, I'm, I... Where she tra treated him like a, like a child, and he was there in that sort of child's gray suit and sort of wandered off like he just got in trouble. On the latest I edition I think what of I'm the trying to say, What I'm trying to say is that... <laughs> by John, by John if, if anyone's true... I, you know, anyway, coming up, <laughs> Deborah Cunningham, Global Liquidity Market CIO stop. at Federated Hermes. She's going to be coming up very shortly, Tom, and she's going to be talking about what's happening in this bond market and all the Fed speak we've had, TK, in the last couple of days. Well, the Fed speak, Peter Bookvar, who writes a wonderful morning note, Peter Bookvar just, just tore in, he went full Bramo on Kashkari. He just ripped him to shreds. What he did he say? Said, he just said, the theory's not there. Get off the eco econometrics and start looking at the common sense of a massive fiscal impulse off the uh, pandemic as well. He also did point out, Lisa, to your world, that today is maybe the first day where notes in bills outside one year, there are no negative yield. Which yeah. is sort of cool. It's very cool. We can it's go like, into that. You know, but I got distracted. I'm looking at um, Justin Trudeau's suit. You're not even listening to me. It's like a three I'm listening amigos. to you. The negative rates. And we're going to get into that. End of an the, era. All the, that good this, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. that but about that suit. Yeah, I don't know. You. you just thought that the gray why don't, was that. Why don't I just, if come I just back up like this, does that? Oh, no. Come on. Honestly, negative yielding. Let's go there. It's really interesting. It's over. You've got 10 seconds. What have you got to say? It's over. It's over. There no. There's zero. But this is the question. Is Japan actually going to end? Let's pick up on that. Juicy story control. next. Can't wait. This is Bloomberg.
equities up this morning by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Here's your price action this Thursday morning. Going into jobless claims about an hour from now on the Nasdaq, we're up by a quarter of 1%. More job cuts for big tech. This time, Amazon <coughs> set to lay off 18,000. We'll pick up on that story in just a moment. I want to talk about the bond market. Lisa and Tom were talking about the end of an era. Negative yielding debt was approaching 20 trillion back in 2020, and now we're down to zero. Your 10-year, 368.45. Your two-year, 438.26. Responsible for this, the shift away from negative rates over at the ECB and elsewhere. Big changes at the Swiss National Bank, changes across Europe, changes at the Fed as we go from zero to four plus in about 12 months. And Lisa, potentially changes at the BOJ as well in the coming quarters. This is shocking to see zero on this chart. As Tom was mentioning, this really is notable because of how much this distorted values. My question is, have we seen the full fallout from this? Is this basically the extent of it? Last year's absolute devastation in 6040, or is there more substantive uh, kinds of developments to come? Still got QT to come from the Federal Reserve, from the ECB, mentioned the BOJ. They might be getting in the mix as well, Tom. <clears throat> Not doing something uh, with the balance sheet necessarily, but perhaps yeah. raising interest rates. Do we take that next step at the BOJ? Some people think we will. I think it's as unpredictable as it was the day they announced the end of, you know, the first movie from sure, yeah. 150 down to 130. I thought Jordan Rochester and others have been brilliant on the complete uncertainty of what they do. I'm sorry, they're going to react off GDP, nominal and real GDP, off of a supposed China reopening. That's more important than theory of yield curve control. Well, you mentioned the China reopening, so let's touch base with what's <coughs> happening on crude. Brent and WTI, the moves over the last couple of days, we've had a move lower of 9% plus yeah. on crude yeah. in the last couple of days. I mean, a real move lower this morning. Trying to bounce, Lisa. WTI, 74.40, up by 2% <coughs> plus on Brent crude, approaching 80 again at 79 50. And something you talked a lot about is, is it really whether uh, crude prices is the way that uh, energy stocks go, or is there some sort of divergence? That's one of the movers that I actually am looking at today. Uh, sort of ironic, considering the 9% move that we've seen in uh, crude over the past two trading sessions before today, Exxon shares are actually up on the day ahead of the open. And this isn't necessarily because of the lift that we're seeing in crude today, but it's because people are looking at its refining business and saying it can actually refine that crude into gasoline lean much better than others. So this is a story of dominance. And Tom, you've been talking about how does America adapt and adjust? America always adapts and adjusted. And these yep. three stories to me highlight how they are adapting and adjusting. With Amazon, it's 18,000 job cuts. How much do some of these layoffs bolster margins more than people expect in the tech complex? Then you have Western Digital. This is a merging of a company, potentially, it's a data storage maker, with a Japanese company. So it's merging, it's <clears> job cuts, and it's dominance when it comes to Exxon, considering that we're seeing the potential for more refining in a time when that really is one of the preeminent concerns. Well, the VIX 22.04 really much unched here as we come into this economic data. What do we got for data, John? We got jobs day tomorrow. We got this morning. Got claims this I'm morning. I'm sorry, January 12th is still key. Got to talk about the ISM yesterday as well. Sub 50 and yeah. going in the wrong direction. Yeah. And you look what's happening with the prices paid. That index <clears> level, I think, was in the 30s for prices paid. So that Does price that indicate story, disinflation? It indicates good disinflation. So I think we should be clear about that. Okay. But then you've got the elevated quits level from the JOLTS report, job opening still at 1.7. Lots of different things happening in different parts. And I think this is always the risk, this isn't it, when you have guests on this program, because you can almost pick your narrative and pick your data to support it at the moment, That's, can't you? David Leibovitz said that point blank. He said, this is a market where you can justify any narrative that you have. So then where do you find your <laughs> That companies? sounds like Bloomberg surveillance. Well, it's easy. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Well, when it comes Don't to give away the plot. Yeah. You can sit and say things are really strong. Look at payrolls on Friday yeah. and what we're expecting. <clears throat> you can say things are really strong. Look at the jolts data. And then I can just rattle off a long list of companies. Tom delivering massive, massive layoffs, including Amazon. I, I, again, the pandemic was a massive one-off, and we're still we're living reacting. it. We're living Year three. It. We're living Year it. Year three. That's, that's still the living proper it. phrase to say it. This is really important. If you are part of Global Wall Street, stop, listen, get out the pen and pencil. She has decades of experience, and Deborah Cunningham at Federated Hermes has, without question, the most blistering beginning of your note. It's short, sweet, and direct. 
It's not over. Deborah Cunningham, you know the worst bond market ever, down five standard deviations off 20-year trend. We've bounced back one standard deviation. We're negative four standard deviations off trend. The majority have a hope and prayer of recovery, and you say cash is king. Discuss what bond price will do this year. You know, our, our overall goal is to maintain a return from a bond perspective that is basically the coupon. So maybe a little bit up from a pricing perspective, maybe a little bit down from a pricing perspective, but not necessarily a windfall that reverses what we saw in 2021. Lisa, you mentioned, you know, that the world having no negative interest rates is shocking. But that's really only the case in the last maybe, let's call it five years or so. Um, if you've been in the market for longer than that, it's normalized. Um, and, and so I think the Federal Reserve is really trying to get people acclimated to what is the real normal in the world, not what has been the most recent normal with, you know, so much in negative rates being part of the part of the environment. And despite the fact that that the market has rallied, both from an equity and a, and a fixed income perspective. If you read yesterday's FOMC minutes, they're not done yet. They are very cautious. They're going to continue this process. Yes, they, they, they are aware and, you know, watching what happens from an economic perspective. But their goal is to bring inflation down. They're, they're doing a good job of it, but it's not done yet at this point. And thinking that the world goes back into negative rates or low single-digit interest rates just isn't part of the picture mm -hmm. at this point. As Rabila Fer uh, Faruqi said earlier in the show of, uh, of, of high-frequency economics, she was talking about the collision course that the Fed and the market seems to be on because the market isn't acclimated to what the Fed is trying to say. How do you think that collision course is going to get represented in this year's trading? You know, I think it's up and down. I think it's going to be a lot of volatility. Um, the, the Fed continues a unified Fed speak around this topic, but investors just don't want to believe it yet at this point. So I think we have right. that up and down market to sort of justify what the Fed is saying. Deborah, and, and with your – Deborah, I got to go here because Federated basically invented the money market fund. Let's, you know, look at me. This is before Cunningham darkened the door, I might point out. Steve Auth remembers when they invented the money market fund. Deborah, I, I want to cut to the chase here. Open-end investment companies, mutual funds, are constrained in how much cash they can hold. Is things so messed up in a Cunningham way that portfolios – can't have enough cash because their prospectuses say they can't have enough cash? No, I think that might have been an issue in 2021, maybe even in 2020. I don't think that's as much of an issue in 2022. If you look at our longer-term fixed income portfolios, at our equity portfolios, we are still overweight in cash, but not as much of an overweight as we were in 2021. So I think it's less of a constraint today than it might have been last year or even last quarter. Deborah, wonderful to hear from you. <clears throat> Happy New Year to you and the team. Looking forward to catching up with you through 2023. Deborah Cunningham there, a federated Hermes. It's not over. The it's message pretty huge clear there, hey? deal. This is an, I, I would respectfully suggest this is an outlier call. This is a massive institution, hugely venerated. And she's just saying on the Bloomberg Total Return Index, you're not going to get a bounce. I mean, that's how this translates. There is a belief still, <clears throat> how by many, that we can go back to the pre-pandemic world, that we can go back to oh, low Greg growth, Peters would say low inflation, over a timeline of 18 months, whatever. race reset. Yeah. I think what Deborah yeah. said then about interest rates, and we would say the new normal. Well, let's talk about the old normal. Isn't that what this is just about, resetting back to the old <clears throat> normal? Because the last 10 years was anything but normal time for central bank policy and what we were seeing in this Dire bond market. Dire straits economy, money for nothing. Absolutely. Ab no question about it. Absolutely. No we had a price-insensitive buyer in the market with a huge balance sheet, and not just one. We had three. Yeah. In fact, we had more than that. Pushing yields lower, 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 to the point that we were, we were getting satisfied with negative yields in, in bond markets because I remember the time when it was started taking place in Europe and people would say, yeah, but it can go even more negative and you want the capital return. 
And so we were in bonds for price appreciation. Do you remember that? Yeah, and how about the fact that, you know, the whole, like, beer goggle comment that we heard from the Dallas Fed, that we've got beer goggles Richard on. Fisher, Richard Fisher, back in the day. Fisher, I remember that, that speech, quote. yeah. Oh, it was a yeah. fantastic speech. Look it up. I think it was 2013 when the yields on, the, on high yield bonds went to what people thought then was a Who record low. Who are we remembering speeches yeah, like that? I love that speech. I love that speech. It was what, fantastic. What <laughs> <laughs> you know, go, really? Let's not go there. Okay. Read the speech, okay? But, but here's <laughs> the thing. You, <laughs> you really, no, no. You really wanted the to go notes. there. I want to make a bigger point here, though. Someone from there Chicago. Is a question, like, there is a dogs. question about whether last year was it. What it means to unwind more than a decade of beer goggles, if you want to go to Richard Fisher's comments, if you want to look at the, the entire ecosystem of debt, of corporate structure that got built up during that era, is it just a decline on the total return index or is there something more significant that happens to reshape the way that credit is disseminated in an economy with rates that are the old normal? <coughs> that, I think, is yet to be determined. I'd go back to the question we asked about an hour and 40 minutes ago. When we talk about unwinding some of the excess, are we talking about the last two years or the last 10 plus? Because the consequences <clears throat> of that are very, very different if you think it's the last two years, Tom, or the last 10. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a fair assessment as well. What I would suggest is, and I've said this a million times, people will adapt along the way. Lisa mentioned yesterday the economy and all the navel gazing is separate from the markets and particularly the equity market. Totally. And I, I just don't have a lot of certitude right now after the humility of everyone, including me, getting crushed. I mean, the triple leveraged all cash fund <laughs> did okay, but the payout, the two and 20 payout on it just killed me. You know, I want to be My clear about- clean wasn't that good. We're joking about what the Federal Reserve, the ECB, and all these central banks did, and I don't even think we're really joking, after they manipulated markets for 10 years, they're still doing it. They're just doing it in the other direction. I remember going around central bank to central bank around Europe, got to Frankfurt, got to Vienna, got to Switzerland. It's a tough job. Catch up with the SMB. And the number one question you'd always ask after a sell-off of any kind and yields pushing up, have we seen an unwarranted tightening of financial conditions? That was the number one question you all always asked when you sat down with these guys, were they leaning in the other direction? That has flipped 180. The number one question you ask now, have we seen an unwarranted easing of financial conditions? The story has totally changed. It's totally changed in just a couple of years. Equity features on the S&P up two tenths of 1% <clears> from New York. Let me look this up. I this is look Bloomberg. Up beer goggles. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. It's another round of votes on the speakership. Today, lawmakers will meet again after Kevin McCarthy failed for a sixth time in his bid to be elected to lead the House. The California Republicans said a lot of progress was made, but still, hardline conservatives didn't make it easy and there was no resolution to the standoff. IMF First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath is urging the Federal Reserve to press ahead with interest rate hikes. Gopinath tells the Financial Times that inflation in the U.S. has not turned the corner yet. She also expects monetary tightening in Europe to be more prolonged than the Fed's. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has urged Vladimir Putin to declare a unilateral ceasefire in Ukraine. The two spoke on the phone today. Erdogan says that ceasefire could be accompanied by a vision for fair solution. And Turkey has pitched itself as a mediator in the war. And strikes on the British rail network reached a critical peak today. Some of London's biggest rail stations will be closed, while some airports will also be deprived of train service. Train drivers represented by the Aslef Union are walking out following a long dispute over pay. Federal Reserve officials have reaffirmed their resolve to bring down inflation. They also warned investors not to underestimate their will to keep interest rates high for some time. Those points came from minutes of last month's policymakers meeting. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. small faction of the Republican Party is basically grinding things to a halt. 
And this matters because there are some real issues like the debt ceiling to deal with in 2023. And what this is underscoring is that they can wreak havoc. Lisa leading that story in the year ahead. That was Peter Truvitz there, the LSE Professor of International Relations. We'll continue that conversation in just a moment. Here's a snapshot of the price action on the S&P. We roll over just a little bit, almost unchanged now, on S&P 500 futures. Going into the opening bell, a couple of hours away still. Going into some data, about 43 minutes away. We get jobless claims in America. Sprinkler data throughout the day, then the big one. Tomorrow morning, it's payrolls Friday. Yields advance just a basis point after moving lower by 18 basis points over the previous. <coughs> Previous two trading days, 369.38. Keep going back to crude. Big move lower. First yes. two trading days of 23 by more than 9%. And here we are up by almost 2%, Tom. 74 23. Into the claims here in less than an hour, John. Um, I would point out also the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index in the last three or four days, hugely accommodative. Yesterday, John Farrow dazzled me with his, his knowledge of Mr. McKinley of Ohio in a politics of long ago and far away. We thought we would get some perspective on the madness in Washington now, and there's no one better than Wendy Schiller, who owns a high ground at Brown University on American uh, politics. Wendy, I'm going to cut to the chase. You and I were channeling the great Alan Nevins on Grover Cleveland in a time from another place, and there was a guy from Maine Tom Reed of Bowdoin College, who changed the rules. What did Tsar Reed do in 1885 or whatever that matters to Mr. McCarthy today? It's, it's very similar. He changed the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee is the gateway to put legislation on the floor. And when you get through the Rules Committee, they determine which amendments you can offer and who can offer them and how long you debate the bill. So Reed basically stacked the deck. He took control as Speaker of the Rules Committee and then gave the Rules Committee and the Steering Committee the, the opportunity to shape legislation and cut out individual right. members. And members gave them the power to do that, precisely what you just mentioned, Tom, the McKinley tariff bill. They all wanted to get it passed. Big industry, Republicans were united. They needed to get it through, and they needed a uniform process to squelch all the opposition, particularly from <clears throat> Southern Democrats who wanted free trade. Right. That's not here today. They don't seem to have a kind of agreement in the Republican Party oh, on their on. singular policy goals. Pelosi had Louise Slaughter. She, with an iron grip, handled the Rules Committee. In a McCarthy House... Does he have a rules committee when maybe Greg Vallier says he's going to give it up to one vote could throw him out of office? This isn't even, this isn't even Pelosi slaughter of five years ago, is it? No, and, but, you know, they're clamoring for more open legislative process, you know, and, and in the midst of all the opposition and name calling, you know, in, in the Senate, the same thing. The parties have really consolidated leadership. Senators complain they can't do anything on the floor. They can't offer amendments. The legislative process isn't really there anymore for, for either chamber. So they're making a valid point that they want a bigger say in what happens. The problem is they don't share the same ideological viewpoint or policy goals, so they will obstruct. And with such a slim margin, it really paralyzes the House. Wendy, the Democrats are remaining quiet, probably wisely so, to allow this to play out without their input. I am wondering, though, we had expected after the holidays to hear from President Biden about whether he would run again. He hasn't announced and talked about that at all. When is he going to discuss that more in full? Do you get any scuttlebutt about what's going on on that behind the scenes? Well, Lisa, that's a great question. It seems to me since the State of the Union address will be earlier this year than it was last year, most likely, it makes sense to take that unique opportunity, do it as a neutral, you know, bipartisan, leader of the country event, uh, and then announce you're going to run. If you do it beforehand, then everything about the State of the Union is tainted by that announcement. So my guess is he waits till after the State of the Union and does announce that he's going to seek the presidency, particularly if the Republicans look like they're in disarray. It really stomps on whatever momentum some of these challengers, like Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump, have going into 2023 uh, to look ahead to 24. Some people would argue the opposite, that President Biden said that he would run again if former President Trump was in the running. Sure, he's in the running, but he's kind of taken a back seat when it comes to leadership, certainly with this latest House Speaker uh, nomination and uh, vote that we've seen go down in D.C. At what point does that factor into what uh, President Biden does? Where does the leadership go for the future in the Democratic Party? 
Well, that's a really great question. But right now, Biden is like he's got a lead in sports analogy. He's got a lead in the game. He's sitting on a lead. The, uh, the other team doesn't have their act together. Why would you step off the field? Why would you give up the game? You know, he's going to go forward. He's got some good cabinet members. He's got some good governors in the wings. I think given today's political environment, people can ramp up pretty quickly to run for president. So I don't think it hurts the Democratic Party. And as long as they stay solid and united, that's the message they put forward, while the Republicans appear to be at the moment in disarray. You know, I, I, I looked at Wendy, and the Tuesday lunch bunch at Brown University is something having to do with pizza and Providence. There's the moderates of the Tuesday lunch bunch, now the Republican Governments Committee, in Washington. I don't think enough is being said here about what I'm going to call, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail on this, normal non-MAGA Republicans. How do they move forward? Well, and Tom, that's a great point because there's 200 of them. You know, McCarthy can say he's conservative and people sort of believe him. But, you know, when you're from California, it's a tough sell if it's not 1985 right. to be a you know, really red Republican. But there are 200 Republicans who want McCarthy to be speaker. So how they come to the table, maybe Steve Scalise, you know, second in command. Louisiana Republican is different from Midwestern Republican. Uh, and they all won closer races than they expected and they want to win again. So I think this is a really big problem for them. They're not just going to lie down and let these 20 exactly. renegades, if you want to call them that, run okay. the show. So well, let, I don't mean to interrupt, but we're running out of time. If they're not going to lie down, what do they do when this, this, this clown show is over? Well, I think that they have to stay, stick, what they should do right now is stick together. They shouldn't relent. McCarthy shouldn't quit too soon because that, that's their exercise of power. The 200 that want McCarthy shouldn't throw in the towel today or tomorrow. Make this go on. Make them filibuster this for a longer period of time and certainly go out to contributors and say, listen, don't give these people any money anymore, even though that's what they complain they want to be protected from. You know, make sure that you stay solid to signal to them that you're not going to roll over today and you're not going to roll over six months from now. I don't know if they can do it, but that's what, what I would recommend to hold their power in the Republican Party in the House. Wendy, a lot of investors try to be politically agnostic. I'm not sure if that's achievable or not, but they at least try. And I think they're probably wondering, watching this play out, when is this consequential for me? Wendy, how long can this go on for before it's truly consequential? I think it can go on for a long time, actually, unfortunately. Uh, it's consequential today. You know, when the, the leader, the free world, the United States is a leader, and, it, and our economic and political powers are tied together. And if one of our chambers is g grossly dysfunctional, then the world starts to wonder if they should invest in the United States. So if we want to issue new treasuries to fund that debt, you know, we have to get more stable. So I think it has implications starting today. The rest of the world's having some issues, too, in their legislatures. But nonetheless, uh, it matters today. Whether that matters to Matt Gates or Lauren Boebert or, you know, Chip Roy, uh, the people who are leading this charge, um, I'm not sure. They're not particularly international in their focus. But that's where the business community, to me, has stayed too silent right now. They have to weigh in and they have to say, listen, we give you a lot of money uh, and we want this thing settled, so get it done. Wendy, thank you. Wendy Schiller there of Brand University. Lisa, I went on to that final point because that's the point you've been pushing repeatedly uh, through this conversation and others as well over the last 24 hours. When does it really start to become consequential for investors, people in this market? And I think that the underneath that question really is the debt ceiling debate and how much we get a new budget. Something that we were talking about yesterday, how much is this by design? That a lot of the Republican Party doesn't want to see that kind of spending that they saw in 2021. How much is that going to be a feature of what happens in terms of a fiscal response and an ability to get some sort of debt deal passed by the end of the year? Tom, your thoughts on this? I, I, I'm away from it. I don't think it's a link to the markets. I just don't. Well, it's clearly not right now. I don't think it's going to be. And that's I why I'm asking at what point does it become consequential at all. I've heard for 50 plus years. You're you not know, alone. It gets fixed. It gets fixed. And that's all. I, I do to, to, to Professor Schiller's brilliance, and she is the best. Uh, and, and that was a clinic, folks, on the 1880s and the effect of Blaine and Maine on the American uh, public. But uh, to, to Professor Schiller's point, there's 200 other people here that aren't in the headlines of the Washington Post this morning. These people, how? what's the level of fury they have this morning, John? David Joyce, I believe, of Ohio. What is his level of fury well, Tom, I've got to say, over as a, this clown uh, show? As a foreigner watching this play out. Yeah, I'm more interested in what you think. I'm trying to work out what the objective is here. You know, I've spoken to Anne-Marie <laughs> a million times. I call her after the show in the afternoon. And I say, can you just explain to me, you know, have they articulated what they want? What is the objective here? And the only answer I get at the moment is they don't like Kevin McCarthy. Right. <laughs> 
should say no, I think this, is, party this, is, this just seems this to come down to they, they don't like Kevin McCarthy and that's it. Mm. It's true. But as a foreigner, it has to create a risk for the United States in terms of what's its policy going to be? What's its spending going to be? Well, I don't think anyone expected much of a policy shift this year anyway. So they're watching this theatre play out for now, Tom, and, and for now, I, I think maybe finding you, it somewhat entertaining, point, but yeah. ignoring it. They just don't like the guy. I, I, I wonder about that. Yeah, sometimes it's that simple, isn't it? From New York, this is Bloomberg. Volatility was alive last year, and it's still alive in the first few trading days of this year. Overall, I think investors will be rethinking portfolio locations very significantly this year. I do think earnings will be under pressure. We forget how cyclical some of these tech stocks are. We're going to get a nasty earnings recession. And so the companies that can deliver on the cost efficiency are the ones that are going to continue to perform. The biggest issue for equities right now is what's going on in the bond market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Into the jobs report of tomorrow in 30 minutes, 29 minutes. The claims report, a first look at the pulse of the labor economy here, uh, looking out into 2023. John, I'm going to look at wages tomorrow, but we've got claims today. The official data says the labor market's still tight. Saw that in job openings yesterday. We're told there's 1.7 jobs open for every unemployed American. And then you've got the layoffs just mounting from company to company. The quote of the last 24 hours, Mark Benioff, Salesforce, our revenue accelerated through the pandemic. Mm. We hired too many people. Yeah. We hired too many people. You're effectively hearing the same thing <clears throat> from Andy Jassy over at Amazon. And the question I think many people are asking this morning, looking at that name, right. is 18,000 going to get it done at Amazon if they really want to address the cost structure of that company. 1.544 million jobs, I believe, at Amazon. They bring it down by 18,000. Think of all those small businesses at Amazon. Are they feeling the same angst as Benioff at Salesforce? And when does this start to add up? So that we see it in the official data, because we're still it's looking for lag. tomorrow. The, the 200, say it lags. We're looking for two hundred thousand on payrolls tomorrow. Yeah. You mentioned wages still in and around five percent. Right. Unemployment could be threatening to drop to three and a half percent. And now we turn our attention to Bremo going full cash carry. She jumps in here. Neil Cash Carry talking yesterday about five point four. Everybody calm down. Some pushback on that, but all of this is hinged off the labor path that John mentions. So I'll go full Kashkari and actually uh, I'll make his argument because I think that there is a lot of support, especially given what we're seeing in the tech world. It is only to 18,000 and perhaps it's to shore up margins, not to necessarily save a business model for a highly profitable company. We have a strong economy still. The labor market seems to show that. You can pick your data point and create your narrative around it. But if you have a strong economy, then what's going to stop the Fed from going further than the market currently okay. is pricing in, and when do we get the ramifications? Doesn't true, you, John. Start off with you. I believe Lisa said in the summary of seven and six, Bullard speaks today. Is Bullard going to go anti Kashkari and say we got to reach out where Ben Emmons is? Nothing moves till seven percent. I don't know what he's going to say specifically, but I think overwhelmingly the committee mm. is still worried about a repeat of the 1970s, and that's why I'd pick up on what Kashkari said in that blog from yesterday, Lisa. That's what stood out for me. They're conditioned by mm. history, and basically, I think for many people watching this, listening to it right now. I think they're of the opinion that this Fed is committed to being late and that perhaps they've done too much already. And, Tom, they won't know. They won't know the answer to their own yeah. question. They've got two risks right now that they want to manage. One is under tightening. The other one is over tightening. They won't find out until it's too late. Right. End of story. This insight's too important. It comes from Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes. A lot of people disagree with her. Lisa, let me start with you. She says the bond market goes nowhere this year. Cash is king, and we will not get price up, yield down. Rubila uh, Faruqi also saying the collision course between the <clears throat> Fed and the bond market going to create more volatility at a time when a lot of people are betting for yields to go lower. How does the bond market respond to a Fed that wants to signal hawkishness, regardless <clears throat> of what the intention is? That's what they want to signal because they want financial conditions to, uh, right. to tighten much more considerably. John, uh, December 28th, I think, is the peak here. 3.88% in the 10-year yield. Uh, I guess it's price down, uh, price up yield down 3.70% right now in the 10-year. So on the 10-year, we got to about 430. I think on a two-year, at one point, we were threatening to break 480. That was a couple of months ago on a two-year yield. So we've <laughs> certainly adjusted. Yeah. The issue many people have, Tom, even if they believe that the terminal rate's five, 
they just think that soon after you don't stay there very long and you deliver rate cuts. And I think this goes to Lisa's point. There's a difference between what this Fed wants to signal right now, hike, 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 hold, and what people think this Fed will do, which is hike into trouble and ultimately need to cut. Yeah, I, again, I, I think it's a parlor game. Let's do a quick data check, John. I'm going to go where we haven't gone, which is a 210 spread, negative 70 basis points. Uh, that bears watching because nobody's watching it. Equity market right now is a snooze. S&P 500 futures going yeah. absolutely Red nowhere. Green. You had some price action, though, in the last couple of days in both the bond market and in the commodity market. Right. So previous two days, 10-year yield down about 18 basis points. Your 10-year this morning, 369.94, <clears throat> we're up a basis point mm -hmm. or so. Previous two days on crude, down 9% plus. Trying to bounce back this right. morning by about 2%, Tom, 74.30 on WTI. The 2023 calculus is varied, to say the least. We get a brief from Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, BNP Paribas Asset Management. Daniel, let me cut to the chase, which is... BMP Paribas has always had a wonderful conservative reticence underpinned by the GDP call. What is the foundational BMP Paribas U.S. and global GDP call this year? Well, I think here we're probably not that far out of consensus. And I guess, if anything, what, what should worry us is how consensus the recession view is, both for the U.S. and Europe. We do think that is what's going to happen, but probably importantly, we think, at least in the U.S., it's what needs to happen. It's it's not so much that a recession occurs, you know, per se, because of a Fed error. You were talking about the labor market. Uh, and I think it's important not to get distracted by what's happening with the layoffs in the tech sector. I mean, we all know what happened in tech in terms of equity prices, but also in terms of employment, you know, was the boom during the lockdowns, and now that's normalizing. I don't think it really tells us all that much about what's going on in the rest of the economy, which is where the labor market is still very strong, uh, wage growth is still far too high, and to get that down to a level the Fed is comfortable with, that's where you have to have the recession. And Dan, one thing we've tried to explore for the tech industry, was the boom in the last two years or the last decade plus? Because if we're unwinding the excess of the last two, then clearly the damage we've got to do will be nothing like the damage we've got to do to a market to an industry that maybe has got an excess built up from the last decade plus. Which one is it, Dan? Um, I think much more uh, just the two-year unwind. Uh, if you look at earnings forecasts, you know, clearly we're well above the trend that you had prior to the lockdowns. You know, what the new normal is going to be, that's what we're trying to find out. I think it's important to remember that in the last two earnings seasons, where you had the key earnings appointments was exactly in tech. So that normalization is happening. Uh, but we think that kind of broader transformation that we've seen over the last 10, 20 years in tech, you know, in growth is still very much in place. We just need to unwind uh, what happened during the lockdowns. Does unwind mean layoffs? Does it mean prices have to go down even more of the stocks of some of big tech? Uh, in layoffs, I would think absolutely. Uh, in terms of prices, I think there it's a little bit less clear. I mean, given that we've already had such a significant move in real rates and valuations broadly for growth stocks are pretty reasonable. That said, in the near term, given that the market is still buying into the near term pivot from the Fed and we've seen Fed funds expectations not recover to where they were, we think that has to reverse. So we have a risk of a bit of a replay of the early part of 2022 20, where real rates go up. Uh, fixed income sells off and also equities and particularly growth stocks uh, sell off because we need to kind of get back to a healthier place in terms of the rate outlook. But, you know, that hopefully is a relatively small short term adjustment, whereas still in the long term, we're very bullish. I feel like the P word is making a comeback. The pivot is going to be a big discussion <clears throat> point. So let's talk about pivot. what let's talk about what that means to you and what we're pivoting to. Right. I mean, we've been talking. John and Tom have done this really well about the old normal versus the more recent normal of rates that were higher or rates that were at zero. What is the new normal that we're pivoting to? Well, if you think of, you know, long-term GDP growth in the U.S., one and three quarters, you know, we do think you're going to get inflation back. The Fed will get inflation back. Maybe it's a bit higher than it was before, but two to two and a quarter. So you come up with, broadly speaking, a 4% nominal yield. So I think that's kind of where we're going to want to be uh, in a few years. Uh, so that's going to be uh, certainly a much more attractive environment for a fixed income investor. I mean, even if we don't get the pivot and rates actually falling by the end of the year, you're still getting a 4% coupon or pretty close to it at this point. So I think that portfolio perspective is certainly one of the key things that changes this year versus what we went through in 2022. Dan, good to catch up, as always. Happy New Year to you and the team. Dan Morris there of BNP Paribas Asset Management out of London.
this morning. We asked the question a few times this morning. Are we unwinding the excess of the last two years or the last ten? We'll talk about that with Tom Forte, the senior research analyst over at DA Davidson, and explore what's been happening with Amazon. Elisa, for Dan Morris, at least, he believes it's about unwinding the excess of the pandemic the last two years for this very specific industry. On a broader level, though, when we were talking about negative yield, there clearly is an excess that needs to be unwound that has been built up over the past decade. What form does that look like, right? I mean, yes, if we're going back to lower rates, say, by the end of this year, by the end of next year, it's not going to be a problem. But 2025, what happens when these companies have to refinance this debt? The maturity wall isn't on the horizon. And I think that's good, the good news for credit, right? Basically, for the next 12 months at least, maybe two years. Yeah. How much longer? But that's the whole thing, right? At what point do people start realizing, wait a second, we need to reset to an era of money actually costing something and something that's actually punitive for companies that were leveraged to a zero rate environment? So what's the new zero? Is it two? What do they cut down to if they cut? It's a great question. We don't know. I mean, honestly, we don't know. Where is the new zero? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Either way, that was uh, what you were getting on investment-grade bonds not so long ago. I, most important research of the back uh, half was Virginia Commonwealth University picked up by the great Olivia Blanchard of we're going to have a reset on all this at a higher level from the gospel of 2%. And it, of course, folds right into the fixed income So one market. thing exploring, Tom, worth exploring <clears throat> over the previous few cycles we set lower and lower lower and we had lower lows for each interest yeah. rate cutting cycle yeah. and likewise in the bond market too are we going to see higher highs going forward from here higher lows as well every time they have to hike go into a hiking cycle and then cut again do they hike I, to higher highs and cut to lower cut to higher lows as well they are going to react to the data alan greenspan of ancient character did an interview the other day and i believe he's 97 and the great chairman Greenspan said, you have to look at the data. And whether you're Ed Hyman or Alan Greenspan or anybody else, there's just going to be ex post. Well, what I'm the, asking, Tom, really, is not, it's not the cynical stuff. It's more of a secular question. Are we going into this new era of higher inflation, unwinding what we've seen in the previous We are going into years, an era where there is a cost of money. That's oh. what, you know, including the Bed Bath & Beyond headlines yeah. just out right now. That was now. what I was going to say. John, it's all about zombies, you know. 100%. That company is zombie. I'm not going to say that on air. I'm going to okay. say that the price <laughs> of money. Say that off air. The, I'll say it off air. The <laughs> price of money matters. On Amazon, on tech, Tom Forty of DA Davidson. Looking forward to that conversation. Mike McKee is going to enter the studio and break down the ADP. There were so many towels at Bed well. Bath and Beyond, I couldn't pick one. I'm overwhelmed by the supply in that store. I couldn't pick I one. I can talk about it. like that 412. Over and over. I'm just overwhelmed. Yeah, she goes, I need supply. pink towels. And I'm like, I remember I the first time I went in and I tilted my neck back to look back at the shower <laughs> <laughs> and so almost correct. fell over. And a shower curtain subsumed you. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, it's another sign that a tech industry slump is getting worse. Amazon cutting more than 18,000 jobs in a round of layoffs aimed at corporate ranks. Most of the jobs being cut are in Amazon's retail division and human resources areas like recruiting. The company has more than 1.5 million workers worldwide. The U.S. is edging closer to send armored vehicles to Ukraine. On Wednesday, President Biden acknowledged that Bradley fighting vehicles may be part of another U.S. military aid package. The Bradley is a troop carrier that's equipped with anti-tank missiles and a 25-millimeter cannon. Meanwhile, France says it will provide Ukraine with light combat tanks. On Capitol Hill, Kevin McCarthy and Republican dissidents still haven't reached a deal to make him the Speaker of the House. McCarthy has been defeated in six rounds of voting over two days. 20 hardline conservatives are blocking his bid. McCarthy says there has been a lot of progress in negotiations, but still, there's no resolution yet. The man accused of killing four college students in Idaho is now back in the state. Brian Koberger could make his first court appearance as soon as today. He was arrested at his parents' house in Pennsylvania last week. Police flew him back late on Wednesday. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
the ADP report out seconds ago. Mike McKee around the table to break down that and jobless claims in about 14 minutes' time. Mike McKee, what do you see? We got a big beat on ADP. I'm not sure what that means, and I don't think economists really do yet either with their new methodology. But 235,000 jobs were added to payrolls, at least as calculated by ADP during the month of December. That is much higher than the 150,000 that was anticipated in the Bloomberg survey and higher than the 127 that we got in the last report. But ADP has come in underneath the uh, payrolls report for the last five months now. So not hard to uh, not not clear exactly what this means. They also now have an annual pay increase number. And they say in December annual rate of uh, pay increases was 7.3 percent. Uh, they're also uh, uh, high, wow. in this case, higher than the 5.1% uh, that we're seeing in the non-farm payrolls number. But still, uh, that's a fairly uh, high number. Biggest gain was, uh, in terms of jobs, was in leisure and hospitality, 123,000. No surprise there. That's what the Fed's been talking about. John's got to get to the markets, Mike. But you remember how wide our lapels were in the 70s? I mean, <laughs> we got to go back to that look. I'm still looking for the photographs of you in a Nehru jacket. Yeah, well, there was there. Good times. But we're going back to the 70s. I can't find a single person that takes this data point seriously, which is why Mike McKee had so many caveats as he read out the economic data. And then seemingly every time we read out this data, the market trades on it anyway. So <laughs> yes. someone takes it seriously enough. Yields are higher at the front end by six basis points on a two-year to around 441. Yields were higher this morning anyway, but just a little bit more of an additional lift at the front end. On a 10-year right now, up three basis points. Futures were slightly negative. Now a little bit more so. We're down by about a quarter of 1% and trying to recover here, Bramo, but they're not major moves. Is this any indication of what payrolls is going to look like 24 hours from now? It isn't just this data point. It's also the, jo the JOLTS data that we got yesterday. We've gotten consistently a hotter than expected <coughs> labor market data that's come out, which is the reason why perhaps this matters, John, more than people previously would think. Because, yes, it's just one data point, but it moves into the narrative that we've seen that's been pretty consistent in labor. Mike McKee's going to be back with us in about 12 minutes, Mike to break down jobless claims. Yep. Looking forward to that. TK, the labour market in focus. Companies are telling us one thing yeah. and the data is telling us something very, very different at the moment. Sandwiched around McKee as well will be Seth Carpenter. That will be must watch for Global Wall Street to get a global briefing on this labour economy as we move forward. Right now, Tom Forte with us. He's senior research analyst at DA Davidson. But what it really is, is a guy encyclopedic on what goes on at Amazon, the background story we don't hear of. I love how you end your note. Tom, you talk about revenge travel. Bramo owns that. And you also talk about we're all going to see Taylor Swift. You got to be kidding me. Did Amazon just blow this with a blowout growth track? to the end of the well, pandemic? Sure. So e-commerce companies in general overestimated demand uh, for the current state of the pandemic. Not just Amazon. You see it at Wayfair. Uh, you see it at Shopify. So I think that what, what happened was uh, initially when the stores were closed, <clears throat> consumers leaned into e-commerce to such extensive levels that there was an expectation that those levels would hold. And first what happened is consumers returned to physical stores. Then they had inflation, so they had more money spent on food and on energy. And then they had revenge travel, and then they had Taylor Swift. So I think you are seeing a return to live events, but from Amazon's vantage yeah. point, as well as Wayfair and Shopify's, people are not shopping on e-commerce. And that's a problem. Lisa, this has just shattered the A&R screen on the Bloomberg. There's 55 buys, three holds, and one cell. Yeah. The street's just violently against what Jesse's doing. Yeah, clearly they uh, they don't see this as being a massive downside. In fact, this might just be just the medicine that Amazon needs to have the same kind of profitability that they're pricing in. I do wonder, though, Tom, 18,000 corporate jobs cut. Does that indicate a much broader wave of job cuts among the rank and file in the months to come? Yes. So I think part of what you're seeing is, so if you look at Salesforce laying off 10,000, you look at, you know, big tech company du jour with more layoffs is that to some extent there was some element of bloated headcount. So you had a very tight job market, especially in the technology area, and you had companies that ramped their headcount very significantly. Some of it was a miscalculation of demand, but I think some of it is turning out to be bloated headcount. 
So I think that there is a possibility that you could see some margin improvement at Amazon and some of these other big tech companies from scaling back their headcount. But I do think it is worrisome, again, for the current state of demand for e-commerce. This is kind of bizarre to me, Tom. Basically, this is like Tom going to the barbers and asking for a haircut and someone pulls out the tweezers. Tom, this is either a big problem and they're not dealing with it, or it's not a big problem and they're just doing something small. I don't get it. Tom, if they've got 1.5 million people on the books, then what is 18,000? So, so think of it as two ways. Amazon basically has two workforces. The blue-collar workforce that employs at the fulfillment center, they had 100,000 quiet reduction in headcount between the March quarter and June quarter of last year, as they basically didn't hire back uh, on attrition, and then the white-collar workforce. And what we're talking about here is the white-collar workforce, 18,000 jobs instead of 10,000 jobs. And I think that is an indication of softer demand and a greater effort for cost controls. Uh, so two different labor forces in Amazon. Here we're talking more about white-collar job layoffs. That's important clarity, Tom. So can you tell me where the other levers are and whether you think they might have to be pulled in the year ahead? The big challenge for Amazon in the third quarter wasn't that their e-commerce was slowing. It was that their higher margin, higher growth, cloud computing and advertising business were starting to feel the negative impact of a challenging macroeconomic environment. Environment. So to the extent that you could see, you see more weakness, then 10,000 could become 18,000, could become 30,000. Uh, we'll see how they continue to manage costs as the demand, especially for cloud computing and advertising, remains in flux in a challenging macro. Tom, what is Jesse going to do about the ginormous headache, the logistics of the last mile for Amazon? They got all those boxes piled up, and it just seems like getting the last mile, getting the last four miles, getting the last 400 yards in New York City is the ultimate battle. Are they going to fix that? I think this is their strength. So if you look at the duopoly of FedEx and UPS, one of my favorite moments in uh, tech was within the last three months when FedEx said, we're about to enter a global recession. Second statement, we're raising prices. So I see an opportunity for Amazon to use their first-party delivery efforts for all retailers. They could break the duopoly of FedEx and UPS. So I see that as actually an opportunity for Amazon. And I think that that's something that 57% of units sold in Amazon were third-party. That could grow to 75% over time. Wow. Wow. And leveraging their delivery effort is what will enable them to do that. That's fascinating. Tom, thanks that's for the detail. Tom this was just brilliant. Classic. A clinic from Tom Forty of DA yeah. Davidson on what he thinks is going to happen with Amazon. <clears throat> Tom, you mentioned the analyst community on the street. The 55 buys, the three holes, the one sell. <laughs> the average 12-month price target on Amazon is 135.27. Trade at 85 at a close yesterday. Tom, return potential close to 60%. Have we had the reality check here yet? Have we had a cathartic blowout? No, I don't think we have. We have not seen nothing like a Tesla cathartic uh, feel. That's on a logarithmic basis. Tesla's ugly. No, Amazon's just been, I don't want to own it. I don't want to own it. And with a vengeance, somebody's going to come in at some point and say, okay, they've cleared the pandemic. Let's move forward. And I go back to margin. I, you know, Decide 101 at LSE, which is profitability matters. Apple has an EBITDA margin of 30-some percent. Amazon has a legit EBITDA margin, unlike Walmart that's picking up pennies out in the parking lot. You mentioned Apple. Big earnings report at the end of this month. All of them. I, I'm fascinated by it. I mean, Gina Martin-Adams is fascinated by what we're going to see. Have we got a problem in tech? Seems so. <clears throat> We've got a problem in the market over the last 12 months? Absolutely. Do we have a problem in the economy? Lisa, that's a very different question at the moment, isn't it? especially if labor market data comes in as strong as it has. We have that print in about five minutes' time in terms of initial jobless claims. It's expected to come in pretty much banging around where it has been and uh, at historically low levels after that better-than-expected ADP report. So perhaps layoffs not making a dent in the overall data. The two-year this morning up seven basis points now to four... 43, let's call it. In the equity market, we roll over just a touch, just a little bit. Equity futures down by a third of 1% on the S&P. Jobless claims data still ahead. We'll break that down with Mike McKee and we'll catch up with Seth Carpenter, Chief Global Economist at Morgan Stanley.
15 minutes ago, so about 15 minutes ago, we had an upside surprise on the ADP report. That came in at 235 upward revision to the previous month as well. So the jobs market data over the last 24 hours has been pretty decent. Jobless claims still to come. The estimate there, 225, the previous number, 225. When no I get bad. that number, Mike McKee is going to break that one down for you. Going into it, equity futures just a little softer, down a third of 1% with the economic data. Let's get to Mike McKee. Hey, Mike. Hey, John. Uh, we are still waiting for that number to drop in terms of the uh computers, but uh, I can tell you the trade balance comes in much lower than anticipated, $61.5 billion. It was 78.2 the prior month, and $63 billion was the forecast. And all this means is the economy is growing faster in the fourth quarter than we thought. These are November numbers, and uh, as of yesterday, the Atlanta Fed was suggesting we were growing at a 3.9% annual rate in the fourth quarter, so significant change there. Jobless claims come in at 204 thousand that is down from the initially reported 225 last month uh, last week however I'm going to put a big caveat in front of this and note that this is the week that included New Year's uh, holidays and uh, Christmas holidays and so um, Probably this number is somewhat meaningless, and it'll be revised higher, uh, and we'll get a, a, a bit of a snap back later. But it does show we're still in that very low jobless claims vicinity, and uh, that is further evidence that the labor market remains healthy. Equities roll over just a little bit more by a half of 1% on the S&P 500, and yields <coughs> push higher by just a little bit more. We're now up by nine basis points on a session on a two-year to 444, on a 10-year to three. 74 yields up on a 10-year by six basis points. Mike McKee, we've got to make sense of this. I'm told by all these companies that times are getting tough, they're announcing layoffs in one very specific industry I know, starting to see it elsewhere just a little bit. Then the official data, Mike, the data this morning, ADP claims, data yesterday, job openings, quits. Makes well, sense you, you looked at the, If you read through the whole minutes yesterday, the uh, staff in particular was noting that a, a lot of companies were saying <clears throat> that it was so hard for them to find workers coming out of the pandemic recession that they're inclined <clears throat> to hold on to them as long as they possibly can. Across December, I, I hope this number's correct. I'm working in real time off the Bloomberg, like Michael McKee's a virtuoso on. Four-week smooth moving average of weekly claims, 230 down to 214 across the span of December. That's not going in a Jerome Powell way, is it? <laughs> it is not suggesting that the labor That's market is weakening. stunning. No. Four-week yeah. moving average, which is a way better number yeah. given the ups and downs you're talking about, you know, with 204,000. I, I just it's just stunning. Well, it keeps the pressure on. I mean, they're going to be uh, – the big question tomorrow is service industry jobs, how many are created, because that's where they're seeing the wage pressures. And so uh, we'll go to that number first at 830 tomorrow morning. Has there been any labor market data in the past couple of months that has surprised to the downside? In other words, showing a weaker than expected labor market? Or has this been almost every single one coming in hotter than people expect? Yeah, almost every single one coming in hotter than people expect, even the uh, numbers in terms of the jolts. Uh, Jolts <clears throat> fell a little bit only because the prior month was revised higher and hirings did not change. They stayed at about the same level. So we're not really seeing a lot of change in the labor market at this point. Do you want a snapshot of where the surprises have been over the last month or so? Go to ECSU on the Bloomberg if you are a subscriber. Basically, everything's surprised to the upside with the exception of one group, Tom. Housing and real estate. Housing and real estate is where the downside surprises are. Mike, everything else is just upside. And it's not completely housing surprise. because construction workers have been getting jobs. It's the mortgage brokers <laughs> who've been losing jobs. Uh, that's I've that's the big issue. I've never even looked at that screen. That's you're that's just a, very a cool font screen. of wisdom. I know. You're just a font been of here wisdom. A while, Tom, you know, that's where all the little I'm snapshots come day. from. I know. Got to catch yeah. up. Old dog, new tricks. Mike McKee. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Coming up next down, I'm going to run. Richard Bernstein of Richard Bernstein Advisors on the Equity oh, Market. Oh, wonderful. Chris wonderful. in Bidley of City, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo, yeah, and exactly. on Amazon a little bit later, we'll catch up with Brent Thill of Jeffrey. So, great lineup. Great lineup. Richard Bernstein the there on value and what it means for uh, 2023 will be timely as well. We are honored to give you the chief global economist at Morgan Stanley. They have a heritage which is defined by Stephen Roach and others over the years. Seth Carpenter joins us uh, this morning. Seth, I'm going to go to the Morgan Stanley way, which is you guys under Roach's leadership codified a vis visible argument. What is the number one thing your team is arguing about as we enter 2023? 
<laughs> Gosh, what sorts of things are we not arguing about? Let me say, I, I, I heard you all just before this segment talking about the ADP data and the, the labor market and whether or not the economy is slowing. And one place where we have um, tried to hold our ground, <clears throat> Ellen Zanger, as you know, is our chief U.S. economist. Uh, she and I have been uh, steadfast in saying we think the economy is clearly slowing, but boy, we're not calling for a recession in 2023. We're still there. Uh, I don't think we're actually in the majority with that view, but the fact that the economy is holding up is, is part of our view there. You mentioned the uh, initial jobless claim claims data. Uh, what we're thinking is going to happen, and this is consistent with the anecdotes from the minutes, is that businesses will try to hoard labor. And so what we're likely to see is slower and slower and slower non-farm payrolls will get tomorrow's data, obviously, where we're looking for about 185,000. Um, but we're looking for a slowing down in hiring. We're not looking for a wave of layoffs. Yeah. Taking out that territory is going to be is is where we've been. We've alluded to the '70s. You're too young to remember the embarrassing lapels Michael McKee and I wore years ago. What actually happens to our economy, and frankly, the global economy, if we get a Neil Kashkari 5.4 percent, a Bullard 6.7, whatever percent? Do we all fall apart and die? I mean, we we move forward, right? Uh, I mean, I do think we move forward, but, uh, you know, we are looking for a soft-ish landing, uh, if I can steal that phrase from Chair Powell. I, I do believe that the committee right now is feeling their way. They are close to being as restrictive as they need to be. It'll be up to the next several data points to figure out exactly when uh, they, they call it quits on hiking. Uh, but then it's going to be a question for them how long to stay restrictive like that. And I think that's the part that the market really needs to internalize is that uh, the Fed is not trying to trash the economy now to bring inflation down next year. They're trying to slow the economy down over a multi-year process. And that really is going to be the difference, I think, between now uh, and the 70s. And for the record, I was alive for um, all of the 70s. <laughs> okay, well, Seth, there is this issue of how much do you actually listen to what Fed officials say and do what they say versus take that as signaling that's playing some game theory to try to get the market to a place so that they can then say, look, we're all good and we don't have to raise rates as much as uh, we previously thought. And I say this as Kansas City Fed's Esther George speaks and starts talking about how she raised her forecasts for where Fed's rates will ultimately end up. This is kind of what Neil Kashkari was talking about a bit yesterday. Does that guide you in any capacity? Capacity, do you trust them or do you push back against them with the rest of the market? Uh, so I trust them in the in the following sense. They are talking about what they think they would do based on the availability of information right now. Uh, and so then what we have to do is overlay what we think is actually going to happen with uh, the, the actual data, what's going to happen with jobs, what's going to happen with inflation. And if inflation keeps coming off, as it has been, and if job creation continues to slow, uh, then I think what they're going to say is, wow, we have got the traction that we wanted from restrictive policy, and we, uh, we're we seeing the slowing that we want, so we'll be, be able to step back. So I, I don't think they're going to get to the heights uh, with the funds rate that some of the members of the committee have pointed to uh, because I think the data will slow enough to give the core of the committee that sort of comfort that they can stop. The problem is, is that the data on the goods inflation has slowed, that you are seeing some disinflation there, but you're not seeing that in jobs. And this is where we go. Let's, let's, let's really uh, end where we began here. This is the big dilemma. Will the Fed keep hiking rates in the face of strong labor market data, even if there are signs of disinflation elsewhere? Yeah, I think if it is st continued very strong labor market, then then I think they they keep going. You know, we're looking for another step down tomorrow, 185. Uh, the ADP data came in. I tend not to look at their numbers, but I do spend time looking at the commentary that comes through, and they are pointing to a little bit of easing of wage pressures as well. So I do think we are seeing signs that we're mm -hmm. going in the right direction, that things are slowing, uh, but there's no sense no. in which right now things are weak. If we went back up to 300 thousand jobs per month and stayed in, then there's no question they keep hiking. Before we let you go, Seth, I want to mark a funeral for negative yielding debt. It is gone. <laughs> it is dead. It is over. The last negative yielding coupon has gone. Will the consequences of the end of the negative yielding era be borne out over the next decade, over the next year, or have we already seen it in what we experienced last year? Oh, I think there's I think there's any number of repercussions to come. And if if we're right and the Fed is able to stick with their strategy of not just 
hiking until they're restrictive, but staying there for at least the balance of this year, uh, then then those higher rates are going to be have have an effect for some time to come. I think the other interesting question that will come up and will be a topic of discussion is going to be one of uh, fiscal sustainability because as those interest right. rates go higher and governments have increased their debt, right. the total interest payment that they're making is going to have to go up as well. Seth, be nice to Ellen Zentner. You know, be just, you know, New Year's resolution. Don't be so argumentative like Steve Roach was years ago. <laughs> Seth Carpenter of the fractious Morgan Stanley team as well. This is a joy and an honor with the Michael McKee as well. Yesterday was the 30th anniversary of Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. This goes way, way back. McKee is one of the few that can reach back into the medieval epic, <laughs> as they say, of how we started out. And for those of you on radio, we're showing, thank you, Catherine Oliver, a Bloomberg Radio, the single best promotion we've ever done. It had one radio one station. One radio station. One yeah. radio station. I've still got mine somewhere. In the acclaimed Bloomberg keyboard. This was started, folks, with the, obviously the inspiration of Michael Bloomberg who said, can we do this by January 1st? And, of course, everyone said no, but the Bloomberg way, Michael McKee, is, of course, we can. And we need to say thank you to Frank Trainer, who was the first guy I ever talked to here at Bloomberg and KO, Catherine Oliver, and a guy named Charlie Pellet and John Tucker. They were there at the beginning. They were, <laughs> they were there, and Charlie and John are beavering away in the back today as uh, they continue their service to the company. The reach that we did, I think, that is so important, very quickly here, Mike, it was the global reach that Mike demanded. Others went more domestic, more narrow. And from day one, we said global radio, global TV. It's been a hallmark of the whole company. It's global. We focus on the news that people need wherever they are. And one, one thing that's so important here is we've gotten the Fed call wrong for 30 years. Yeah, <laughs> but we're in good company with that. <laughs> well, congratulations to all, and particularly to Catherine Oliver and the founders of Bloomberg Radio uh, and TV. 30 years on for this institution. Uh, we are going to continue. Futures deteriorate negative 20 off of that uh, shocking set of economic statistics. Ten-year yield out nine basis points. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. It's another round of votes on the speakership. Today, lawmakers will meet again after Kevin McCarthy failed for a sixth time in his bid to be elected to lead the House. The California Republicans said a lot of progress was made, but still, hardline conservatives didn't make it easy and there was no resolution to the standoff. Strikes on the British Rail Network reach a critical peak today. Some of London's biggest rail stations will be closed, while some airports will also be deprived of train service. Train drivers represented by the Aslef Union are walking out following a long dispute over pay. Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan has urged Vladimir Putin to declare a unilateral ceasefire in Ukraine. The two spoke on the phone today. Erdogan says that a ceasefire could be accompanied by a vision for a fair solution. Turkey has pitched, pitched itself as a mediator in the war. Shares of Bed Bath & Beyond are plunging today. The chain warns that there is substantial doubt about its ability to continue as a going concern. Bed Bath & Beyond says it's considering all strategic alternatives, including obtaining relief under the bankruptcy code. And Bloomberg's learned that First Abu Dhabi Bank has been exploring a bid for London-based Standard Chartered. It would be a complex deal aimed at building an emerging markets lender with more than $1 trillion in assets. Shares of Standard Chartered are soaring. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. business leaders, certainly at the moment, they say that what the headwinds that they're facing now is almost more challenging than it was in the height of the pandemic. It's lots of input costs coming in, higher prices for, for businesses themselves, which means that 
Some of those are feeding through into the prices that consumers are paying. There's a really tight labour market. Supply chains are a little bit easier and more straightforward than they were in the early part of last year, but freight costs are still much higher than they were pre-pandemic. Helen Dickinson, the British view there on the challenge of retail going forward. This is great, and, and Lisa and I can do this. We are so thrilled to bring you John J. Edwards III, who is an extinguished member of luxury journalism. And this goes to Fargo. In your days in Fargo, if you go to the Wall Street Journal mansion section, mm. down near Rapid City, there's a guy who won the Powerball who's trying to sell his 50,000-acre ranch for $37 million. Okay, well, what's he going to furnish it with? Is he what's gonna he going to furnish? He's got to go to bed, 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 how, many, how many towels can he get? And of what <clears throat> tenors and colors? 14 bathrooms, 15. To, <laughs> the guy, it's his fault, folks. We all do this. It's like, you know, it's like porn for older people. Uh -huh. It's John J. Edwards' fault that we have the Wall Street Journal Mansion Edition. Uh -huh. What's it like doing the Mansion Edition, <laughs> launching it, and doing it as you and your team did? Uh -huh. Well, it was a lot of fun, actually. Did you it know was... it would be as successful as it is? You know, I think, yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It, it seemed like, you know, it was a good fit for our readership. Very interested in high-end uh, <laughs> really? luxury real estate. Really <laughs> successful. Yeah. Let's bring it over to the latest crisis, which is Let's Bed, do. Bath & Beyond. Those people aren't going into Bed, Bath & Beyond. Nobody else is as well. That's the Why? problem. Well, yeah, they've they've had a lot of uh, execution problems on top of the issues that are afflicting, you know, retailers in general. You know, so they've uh, they've had just multiple quarters of you know uh, negative uh, growth. Uh, they have been uh, really struggling with their merchandise mix, and and now it's been you know cascading for for some time. You know, we've we've been reporting uh, you know that uh, suppliers have been holding off on. Uh, you know, giving them product because they're concerned that, uh, you know, they're not going to be around forever. They're not going to get paid. And uh, as we see today, you know, they issued a going concern warning. So, you know, they're, uh, they're worried they okay. might not stay in business. I'm going to piggyback on something that Tom has been talking about a lot. Mm -hmm. Why has Bed Bath & Beyond existed in the form that it's been in for so long, given all of the distress that people knew about mm -hmm. and people were penalizing it for? In yeah. other words, is this going to be the first of the zombie roll-up? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, it's you know they they uh, a lot of the problem has been their their private label strategy. They <clears throat> they bet big, you know, starting uh, you know several years ago on. Uh, designing more of their own products, you know, ideally, if that works, you know, you, you get uh, higher margins because you're not paying outside suppliers for things. Uh, the problem is that they just executed it extremely poorly under two consecutive uh, CEOs. I guess the, the, the other way of asking this mm -hmm. is you get a lot of chances when money's free. Mm -hmm. People can keep giving you a lifeline to keep going at it. Is this basically the beginning of the end of some of these sort of companies that have been struggling for a really long time? Mm -hmm. I think of Sears and how long that whole debacle took to, to play right. out. Right. You think about some of the real laggards. Is this basically where the where the music stops mm -hmm. and suddenly they have to justify performance and not just the dream? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to see, you know, it, uh, what ends up happening out of uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. They very well might end up just being one of those names that, you know, we... <laughs> You know, think back years from now. Oh, we remember they, they existed once. Yeah. Yeah. On the ra on radio, they're putting up a chart of Bed Bath & Beyond on TV. It spells zombie. Okay. <laughs> I, we, it's not us to badmouth companies. I don't want to go there other than, as Lisa mentions, their track record mm -hmm. total return is bleak as well. I'm going to go to the Bloomberg, as John J. Edwards III can do, and look at the weighted average cost of capital. Mm. These clowns have 81% debt, mm. and they're not a bank. They have 81% debt yeah. with a blended cost of 5.3%, which Grandma will tell me is ginormous. It's just simply what Lisa said. Mm -hmm. Now money isn't free. Were they kept alive for ten painful years because money costs nothing? I, yeah, I think that's got to be a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, they they were able to sort of skate <clears throat> along. You know, they they you know had right. sort of multiple you know uh, recovery plans, and uh, you know, and then they changed their uh, <clears throat> their management. You know, they right. went with Mark Tritton from uh, from Target, who had success with private label there, but he you know sort of tried to. 
uh, play too much of the, the target playbook. Did and, Amazon and ruin that. them? I mean, I was in there the other day looking at the Everyman Mauve Glow Towel. They were out of it. Mm -hmm. I wanted the pink, the Mauve Glow Towel at $22. We're going to get five or six of them for the fourth bathroom. <laughs> sure. Vet Bill. Vet Bill, Vet Bill wanted, Bell. the dog wanted the, the towels. They didn't have the towels out. But come on, the people that are at Bed Bath & Beyond, they're walking over, in, they're watching the show, thank you, and they're <laughs> clicking on Amazon and their phone going, I want those mauve towels. Yeah. Did Amazon kill Bed Bath & Beyond? I mean, it certainly didn't help, right? I mean, and and I think that's where you, you get into, you know, they, they faced a lot of the issues that other retailers faced. Everybody's been competing with Amazon and Walmart and, and you know, and, and has been struggling to greater or lesser extent, but there were specific execution problems at Bed Bath & Beyond that made it even worse. Did you ever go visit any of those mansions at the Wall Street <laughs> Journal? Did you actually go out there and see one uh, of those monstrosities? I personally did not visit any of, of the ones that we ran. No. These things are like 15,000 square feet. I can feet. tell where your oh, head yeah. is, Tom. You're just saying, <laughs> I mean, like, like, I go with you? You, know, you, you look at them and you go, store. really? Okay, yeah. well, let's go this back. This is John Edwards' fault. <laughs> I want to go back to something that you said, Tom, and I thought it was a really stellar point, which I is... Okay. You did great. The Bed Bath yes. & Beyond was this a company kept alive by free money. Mm -hmm. And it raises another question on top of that, which is how many more Bed Bath & Beyonds are they? How much is this going to become a common story versus mm -hmm. the idiosyncratic tale of a company retail, with execution right. issues? Yeah, well right. said. What's it mean for retail? Yeah, Seriously. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to name any other uh, no, companies. You, you uh, no, 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 you can't. You can't. There's very serious, <laughs> no, there's yeah, very yeah. serious laws on this. Yeah. Don't mention the names. No, but, but it's like mid-level department stores get killed. Yeah, yeah. Is it the teenage stuff? What gets killed here? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that that mid-level uh, area where, they're, you know, it's, it's difficult to see what they're appealing is overall, you know, they, they're not high end enough for the high end. They're not low end enough for, you know, people who are looking for true bargains. Uh, they're going to struggle. Uh, you know, I think, you know, everybody likes uh, to see, you know, a nice uh, sort of transition from, uh, you know, calendar year to calendar year. But uh, as bad as 2000, uh, you know, as, as bad as 2022 was for a lot of these retailers, 2023 is not looking all that much better. Uh, you know, a lot of these these issues are still out there. The uh, the high inventories, uh, you know, um, that they have to work through. So yeah, it's going to be a struggle, especially with money not being free. By the way, I love that as you talk about this, and I'm I'm very interested. Tom is looking at mansions over here. I guarantee you, <laughs> he's looking at the mansion tour and trying uh -huh. to come up with something to ask you about for his next purchase. Oh come on, this is Beaver Creek out in <laughs> Colorado. Yeah, Lisa, this says you yeah. ski in, ski out, twenty two million. That Do says you. Oh yeah, you want to buy that? Go ahead. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. No, honestly, I could just guarantee that. I nailed that yeah, one. Yeah. 10,500 square feet. Exactly. For a ski home. <laughs> you know? I know. Well, it's for a select crowd. But as you said, none of those people are going to be shopping well, at Bed Bath & Beyond. Hold on a second. But there is another question yeah. to this, which is how many of the retailers that really are struggling still have real estate? Mm -hmm. And how much is that going to be helpful versus hurtful? Well, you know, it, it's uh, it's it's better than not having it. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of these companies have had yeah. retail, you know, have had real estate. <clears throat> for a long time and it hasn't been the panacea that uh, you know people have thought you know yeah. I think it, it can be hard to repurpose a lot of these uh, retail uh, facilities you know certainly ones that are uh, connected to malls you know if you sell you know the part that they own yeah. it's still connected to a mall that's probably failing. 15 seconds your team leads on this what do all these empty stores in America do? What do they do? I mean, a lot of them are, t are working to, you know, sort of repurpose, go to, uh, you know, entertainment okay. uses, uh, experience, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, uh, there's need for more residential conversions. So you, you know, think we're going to see residential conversions? Yeah, I, we're going to see okay. more of them. Yeah, we're out of time. John J. Edwards, the <laughs> third with us here with his Thank true you. expertise on real estate. We'll have him on much more here through the year as well. That, that was I, that was I learned about. I mean, I never got Bed Bath & Beyond, but fine. Well, I think you know, a lot we're making of other jokes people clearly about it, didn't. But Pharaoh yeah. has the whole thing right. You walk in, and the inventory is overwhelming. Well, it's just hard to find what you want in an era of, of internet uh, sales. It seems like well, I'm why frugal. bother? I do you think, know, I'm though, frugal. I'm still thinking about the idea of repurposing some of these spaces. You asked this question, huge story. And huge story. you know, what do we get? A lot of axe throwing, or you know, escape I rooms. Know. I mean, I water know. parks. I'm just wondering what yeah. experiences <clears throat> have lasting power in some kind of capacity. You know, last time I walked into Bed Bath and Beyond was to get a shower curtain. Nixon was president. You know, so yeah, how's, I the shower, how's the shower curtain? Hold I haven't changed the sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why they're hurt. Is it brown? Uh, it's brown. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, we won't go there. Futures deteriorate, negative 21. Dow futures for John Farrell, negative 166. A VIX expands out a little bit, 22.46. Tomorrow, join us for Jobs Day. Good morning.